Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, let me welcome you to the third day of our National Management Accounting Conference of the Institute of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka. We have had uh, three very good days of uh, sessions, the inaugural day, uh, where we had the governor of the central bank, the champ, the uh, president of the uh, International Federation of Accountants and Professor Ho Yu Ki. I think he spoke on a very, very important topic of the Singapore experience, reviving the economy post-COVID case of Singapore. I think today it was there, uh, which a lot of uh, uh, prominence given to it. And uh, of course, on the second day, we had uh, also another very good uh, sessions on the the uh, debt problems and the critical economic issues and of course the export economy. So here one of the major areas uh, we discussed uh, as a uh, area for a major growth uh, sector for export economy was the IT industry. So I'm very happy that uh, we have been able to organize this session today on digital transformation for a technology-based economic revival. I think we have a very eminent panel uh, including the uh, uh, Secretary of the Ministry of uh, Technology, Mr. Jayanta De Silva, someone uh, with a lot of uh, private sector experience, and we are hopeful that uh, these targets that we are setting will uh, really uh, be achieved in this moment. So uh, uh, just to introduce you, our chairman, because I think he is the key person today, and of course he's assisted by his co-chairman, uh, Mr. Channa Manoharan. I think uh, everyone uh, we'll know him. Uh, he is uh, really a founder member of uh, uh, CMA Sri Lanka, a fellow member of our institute, and of course, a very prominent uh, uh, chartered accountant and uh, uh, more involved with the IT sector, uh, the chairman of uh, 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 Slascom. I think he's done a great uh, deal to the IT sector, and uh, this was one of the reasons that we invited him uh, to chair this session. And uh, Chanda is also with... Uh, a partner of Pricewaterhouse uh, Coopers and also a member of the leadership team. So he's come with a lot of uh, experience. I'm sure that uh, he's very well known uh, at the time that uh, maybe um, uh, Mr. Jayanta De Silva was the chairman of the ICT agency where they were working very closely. And uh, we have the people from the education sector, the professional education, the, the uh, university education, which has really taken uh, a pride of place. And I must say that uh, uh, ICT has taken uh, Sri Lanka by storm. And of course, uh, we need certain compulsion. And I see the only way forward, as what was said here, uh, is uh, technology-based economic revival. So with those introductory remarks, may I hand you uh, hand uh, over to Channa to take over. Thank you, uh, Professor Watwala, uh, for the kind introduction. and. Uh setting the stage for day three, uh, and it's indeed a privilege and a pleasure to uh, be amongst all of you and to have um, among uh, eminent panel of speakers. Uh, to set up proceedings, let me first uh, introduce uh, my co-chairman to the session, uh, Ruchire Pereira, uh, who is no stranger to CA, uh, CMA. He's a, a fellow of the Institute of Certified Management Accountants, uh, serves in, the, in, in, in your council, uh, and also a member of uh, CPA Australia, an associate member of the Charles Institute of uh, Management Accounts UK, and holds an MBA from the Postgraduate Institute of Management uh, affiliated to the University of uh, Sri Jayawardenepura. He's also an alumnus of the Department of Accounting of the Sri uh, of the Sri Jayawardenepura University. Um, he Ruchira has held many uh, uh, public and uh, private sector positions. Um, he, he he has led. Uh, um, uh, 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 he, he's been involved with Richard Peterson and Company, Camso, Lodestar, um, uh, Hyderman International, Fenton's, and Taj Airport Gardens Hotel. He's currently functioning as the Vice President of the uh, Vice President of Finance of uh, Analytical Instruments Private Limited. In addition to uh, he, the board roles, he's a visiting lecturer of the University of Sri Jayawardenepura uh, for BS Accounting Special. Uh, and uh, he's a much sought after uh, lecturer in the finance uh, field. Uh, uh, Ruchira will be assisting me uh, in the proceedings today. Um, so coming back to the topic at hand, uh, like what Professor Watawala said, uh, uh, if you look at government policy in terms of vistas of prosperity, uh, a, a digitally enabled economy 
has been very clearly articulated in the policy framework. Uh, the policy framework also uh, uh, has underpinned the growth trajectory of the economy based on how digital technology be used uh, to bring in efficient, much needed efficiency uh, uh, in the overall economic activities of the country, also to create a digitally enabled citizens uh, and also uh, uh, technocrats who will be world beaters. So in that context, I think the topic and the speakers and the panel that, we are, uh, that have been uh, selected today is quite apt. Um, we have uh, uh, from the uh, um, uh, public uh, policy side, uh, and also from a uh, 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 government enablement of uh, the economy, we have uh, the uh, giant de Silva uh, who will be talking to us about the digital transformation, the backbone of economic revival. Uh, and for any such revival, I think the, uh, the digital transformation and digitally enabled education sector is important. So we have about uh, uh, Henrika Bandara, uh, uh, Vice Chairman of uh, Vice President of CMS Sri Lanka, and also um, uh, Professor Harendra Kariwasam, uh, 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 who will be talking on the education side. And no digital transformation of economy uh, is possible without the financial services sector taking a lead. And therefore, the impact of digital transformation in the finance sector is a very important piece. Uh, and we have Ajit Salgado, uh, Group CIO. Uh, talking about that. Um, uh, uh, and I think uh, in addition to all of we see, uh, there are positives and negatives of the pandemic, uh, which has kind of accelerated the digital journey of many a nation. Uh, and I think uh, uh, therefore uh, this topic is absolutely uh, uh, of uh, uh, paramount importance and to understand the trends, the changes that are going to take place and how Sri Lanka will adopt uh, uh, in that uh, uh, scenario. Uh, to use uh, digital uh, uh, transformation uh, for economic revival. So uh, uh, given the context, so let me move on to introducing this, the, 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 the speaker lineup uh, today. Uh, we have uh, Jayanta De Silva, who is uh, uh, no stranger uh, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to most of us. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have Jayanta uh, uh, addressing us today. Uh, uh, Jayanta uh, uh, is the secretary to the Ministry of Technology, uh, spearheading uh, um, uh, and taking a lead in the digital uh, uh, transformation of uh, 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 the key sectors of the economy. Uh, he has played a vital role in, uh, uh, in uh, taking charge of the government's policy and the initiatives uh, in uh, enabling uh, the digital transformation that is uh, required. Uh, and Jayanta is uh, 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 playing this role quite well. And uh, I have interacted with Jayanta in my role as chairman of SLASCOM the last 12 months. And it's indeed a pleasure to have him uh, drive uh, uh, the key important uh, initiatives of the government. Uh, the great thing about Jayanta is that he's from the private sector. So he's bringing the private sector rigor uh, uh, in, in public sector policy and uh, execution. Um, uh, Jayanta, uh, uh, in a, prior to his role as secretary uh, to the uh, Minister of Technology, served as the chairman of ICTA. Uh, uh, prior to that, uh, he served uh, uh, as the uh, country head for IFS Sri Lanka. Um, uh, uh, and uh, Jayanta has played a pivotal role in policy influencing and also creating some uh, uh, fantastic organizations as a founder member of SLASCOM. Uh, uh, he kind of enabled uh, uh, bringing the industry together uh, from, um, uh, from IT and the BPM sector. Prior to that, he was chairman of the Software Exporters Association, a, a body which was from, uh, uh, played a very key role uh, in uh, 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 charting the paths for the export economy in terms of IT and BPM services. Um, uh, I'm uh, keeping the introduction brief because Jayanta needs no introduction uh, to the sector, but I think um, we are indeed privileged to have you uh, here today, uh, Jayanta, and look forward to listening to your insights and sharing uh, how the, um, uh, you will, the government is uh, enabling uh, a digital, digital uh, economic revival through uh, a, a digital uh, economy. Uh, and also, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Hen uh, uh, Bandar. Uh, we served together in the uh, council of uh, uh, CS Sri Lanka, and now uh, he's the vice chairman of, uh, vice president of uh, uh, CMA, and uh, he'll be uh, 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 addressing us 
uh, on the uh, digitizing professional education. Hena uh, Bandar uh, is a fellow and a founder member of uh, uh, CMA uh, Sri Lanka, is a vice president uh, as well, as I mentioned earlier, and also is a vice president of SAFA. He's a re recipient of the CI CMA Award of Excellence in Business Management. Uh, his contribution to the field of professional education counts more than three decades. Hainayaka uh, is a past president of uh, AAT Sri Lanka, past president of uh, uh, Association of Professional Bankers, council member of CA Sri Lanka, and the director of the Institute of Bankers of Sri Lanka, and the council member of uh, Sri Lanka Institute of Advanced Technology Education. Hainayaka uh, uh, Bandara is a, a career banker. Uh, he last served as the CEO and the general manager of uh, National Savings Bank, and also chairman of NetWealth Securities, and he has held many uh, uh, positions both in the private and the public sector. Currently, he serves in the advisory council of APBSL, an uh, independent director of Prime Finance and council member of Institute of Charter of uh, Chartered Professional Managers of Sri Lanka. Uh, welcome uh, uh, to the panel uh, here tonight. Uh, let me uh, hand over uh, the remaining introductions to uh, my uh, co-chairman, Ruchira. Uh, thank you, Chanda. So let me introduce my fellow council member, Professor Harendra Thariya Vassam. Uh, Professor Harendra is, the, is a professor in accounting. He's the head of the Department of Accounting of University of Sijavatanapura. Uh, he's the director of the Accelerating Higher Education Expansion and Development Program. It's a World Bank project of the University of Sijavatanapura. Professor Harendra also serves as a member of the director board of uh, National School of Business Management Limited, NSBM. He's, he is also in the board of management, postgraduate institute of archaeology, board of directors of Lanka Sadasa, and national trade negotiation committee. He also serves as a member of the council of the CMA Sri Lanka. He is a fellow council member of CMA Sri Lanka, uh, serving in the same council of me. So now I have pleasure of introducing Mr. Ajit Sargadu. He is the group CIO of Sampath Bank. Ms. Sargadu has over 20 years of experience in the banking and finance sectors. He is a visionary leader who has provided guidance to implement innovative approaches in the financial services industry of Sri Lanka. Mr. Salgadu holds a bachelor's degree in electronics and uh, telecommunication engineering from the University of Moratua and a master of business administration from the University of Colombo. Also, he is a CMA accountant, CMA Australia. Uh, he has held numerous roles in prominent organizations around Sri Lanka. Mr. Salgadu is the group chief information officer of Sampat Bank PLC and director of Sampath Information Technology Solutions Limited, a fully owned subsidiary of Sampath Bank PLC. He was the past president of Southeast Asia Regional Computer Confederation and Computer Society of Sri Lanka, and also a member of Board of Governors of Arthur C. Clark Center of Modern Technology and Bank, CS, CSIRT. In addition to above, he holds the prestigious People Leader IT Award in the National HR Excellence Awards 2016, which was awarded to him by the Institute of Professional Management in Sri Lanka. So those are the introductions, Chairman. So now maybe now we can move into the first presentation. Thanks, Rusha. Uh, 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 so uh, uh, the first uh, to go is uh, uh, Jayanta De Silva. Jayanta, I'm inviting you uh, for your presentation. Uh, over the 25 minutes, Jayanta will cover on digital transformation, the backbone of economic revival. Over to you, Jayanta. Thanks, Chana. Hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, Professor Lakshman Watwala, uh, distinguished panel, chairman and co-chairman, uh, my good friend uh, Chana. Thank you. And um, good afternoon to all who are participating. Uh, first of all, may I thank you and thank CMA uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to discuss a very, very important topic where this government is driving quite seriously. Uh, as Chana explained uh, the, at the initial stage itself, uh, technology was one of the key aspects uh, that this government was focusing on. Uh, in that context, uh, a technology ministry was formed uh, under the leadership of the president himself, uh, where we started almost one year ago. Uh, since then, or even well before that, successive governments, very frankly, 
has done a lot of work uh, in the digital sphere and the technology sphere. Uh, but some of these projects, unfortunately, has not given the desired results. Uh, obviously, uh, one would, without any argument or hesitation, would accept that this country need digital transformation. This is where we should fo focus. And this is where we have a strength, where we can be of in par on a table with anywhere in the world. I was, uh, in fact, I'm still at IFS uh, for 25 years. I traveled around the world and met a lot of people around the world and Swedish guys being uh, very research oriented, we have proved beyond doubt that Sri Lankans are equal or better in most of the countries. So digital transformation is something that we have, that we have the resources, we have the content, we have the will to do it. But as I said, one would easily say that some of these programs that we have done in the past have not given the desired results. So I will discuss about that and how we, through the experience, through being a private sector person right throughout my life, how we uh, like engaging in SLASCOM and how the challenges we faced when we want to interact with the government and put some uh, projects uh, into place and into reality. I'll just start with one, uh, first of all, when SLASCOM was formed, uh, we, we had a very, very, uh, very planned uh, operational plan. Operationally, we, we put a beautiful plan in. And then when we were doing, uh, when we predicted that we will do a billion dollar, uh, people laughed at us. I think Channa could remember, uh, people laughed at us. Uh, when we said 5 billion in 10 to 25, right, people ridiculed us. Uh, but as you know, right as we planned, we did 1 billion or more. And today, uh, Slashcom is, uh, is pushing with all its might to make the 5 billion in 2025 a reality. Now, as a government, right, we have, uh, as you know, we have put a target of 3 billion in 2024. I will, I will explain later about it. Now, now, in order to do that, we went through some of the projects that we had done earlier. We the intentions were very good. The funds were available. We had done projects, but operationally we have failed. Just to give you a few examples. The ID card project, as all of us know, is a 20 year old project. Unfortunately, it never came into being. We too criticized it. We were also, when we were on the other side, didn't understand. But today, being in charge of the UID project, I know the challenges that we are facing. In. But through our experience, we have managed to get the ID card on, on ground, on wheels. And fortunately, I will explain in detail, the ID card would be a reality next year. And this particular ID card would be one of the most modern uh, digital IDs in the world. Let me take a few other examples just to show you uh, what has happened to some of these digital enabling projects. If I take the digital signature, the digital signature was available far back in 2011. But as you know, still we are unable to make it adaptable to the desired level that we really want. But today, fortunately, there are about three, uh, over three trillion worth of transactions going through the banks through the digital signature. Now we are pushing this to make it more adaptive, more adapted. So when we really looked at it, it is a case where we have the brains, we have the knowledge, 
and we also have the funds you'll be surprised but the adaptability in the case of adaptability we have failed so i need i am planning to address this with you because we all have a responsibility to ensure that this country economically we revive this economy and we actually be part of the development of this country i know most of you would support us so i'll take few uh, few uh, examples again uh, with you in order to explain what we are planning what we are doing and what is your role and what how you would benefit and as a country first of all as channe explained digitally enabling and digital friendly government is a must most of the government projects unfortunately have not been successful the world bank says is very alarming 90% of the projects supported by world bank has not given the yielded yielded the uh, expected results now this is exactly very embarrassing when you go for a world bank team meeting so why is it they are reluctant to fund some of our projects because of the failure rate that we they have experienced many other agencies also has the same feeling so i will address some of these things with you because these are very simple things let me also exp uh, explain a little bit of the world trend in moving into digital world most of the donor agencies and most of the developed countries are going with a concept called government digital infrastructure government public digital infrastructure now what is public digital infrastructure most of these agencies were funding or helping us in many of the other infrastructure like civil infrastructure irrigation infrastructure and many other but today the countries are focusing or putting their money or putting their funds on digital infrastructure they know that this is the way you we you and i would call in different names but the fact remains that it is investing in digital infrastructure so the basic of this when we analyzed was our identity how would one person without any doubt identify a per, identify a person and work on his identity as you know today the more and more digital world coming to be remote identity virtual identity is a must the 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 importance of a good identity system you don't need a card a digital id is of prime importance so when we started the first job that we took was to ensure that we produce a digital id for every citizen of this country a digital id that cannot be duplicated can be trusted 100% and one could easily use the digital id plus the digital signature and work remotely on anywhere in the world so this is what we are planning to do i am happy to announce that everything on this digital id or the uid project is now been done finalized and we are about to put our rfp out next week this was extremely a tough thing because i'm i'm very reluctant to say that most of any good thing or anything that we try to do is highly politicized in this country so we have to understand as professionals keep politics aside 
We are not politically inclined in any way. We just want to ensure that this country prosper and the economy revives as rightly mentioned by you all. So the basic document or the basic feature should be the UID. Uh, if I explain about the UID a little bit, why do we say that this is going to be unique? This is going to be one of the best in the world. Now, most of the ID cards that have been available, we all know could easily be duplicated. Once an ID is duplicated, a passport can be duplicated. Once a duplicated identity, you lose all the virtual transactions and all banks will not be able or not have the confidence to go in to a virtual world. So this, we have to be 100% sure that this is going to be unique and it's the person and everyone who uses us directly or indirectly has huge confidence to use this. So when we started this project, we got biometrics in for the first time. I mean, we had the facial like our standard, but we never used it. So what we started is we put 10 fingerprints on the ID card. You cannot duplicate. Just with your thumb, you could be identified anywhere in the world, to be very honest, not only in Sri Lanka. We brought the Icavos, uh, we brought the uh, iris. So a person, if you really want, can be identified from far away. So ease of business, ease of doing, when you go through the channels at airport, you can just walk in. We are starting the walking process. We are starting first at Matala. We are just, you just come in, go in. You don't need even to show your ticket. You just board the plane. It, this is the where the world is moving on. If we are going to attract tourists, we have to ensure that this type of infrastructure is available. So the new ID would not only be for local citizens, you will have a digital ID even for any person who comes and visit this country. You will have a digital ID for every organization in this country, where the organization would be identified uniquely and without any hassles. So all this would come. So the 10 fingerprints would be available. The iris, the eyes would be available and a face to photo, face to face uh, comparison, Aikawa, Aikawa standard uh, would be available. So this is going to help the general public a lot, the businesses a lot. So once we have this in place, many of the things that could be integrated virtually into the system will, will, be, will be enabled. I'll just give you a few examples will not take very much time. There'll be a data layer. The data would be owned by each individual uh, entity. Now, if you take the ID card information, would be managed, owned by the ID department. If you take RMB, RMB will have their own data. They will manage, they will have all the security. Today, if you go to RMB, you have to carry a huge file here, in future, you don't need to carry anything unless, of course, you have your thumb, not even your ID card. You just go there and just get the passport. So it's so easy. You go to a bank, you just open with your thumb. You go to take a telephone, you just put the thumb, you get the number. So this is going to ease the life of all the people in this country and help the businesses to do it remotely, easy and very much less expense. So it's very briefly, I explained about the UID project. Very soon, you will see the full features coming up. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be very glad to answer. I, I can talk a lot of about the ID project, but I'll be have been very brief. The second one that we thought is, as you all know, as a country, we have been accused of a lot of other things like fundamental rights, right? So we thought the first thing to do was to 
enable and computerized or digitalize the courts. Now there too, we took a huge stance. We thought we'll, we'll IT enable or digit 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 digitize the whole court system. Uh, we are coming and also it's the same thing, it's just a week or two weeks away. Now, what are we planning to do there? First time in our part of the world where every court proceeding would be recorded video as well as voice. Everything would be recorded. People will have the utmost confidence. People would be able to uh, not you should not go to a court. You can stay at home. The lawyers can stay at home, options. And then the whole court proceedings would be computerized. Just to explain a little bit about the proceedings, let me very briefly tell you. Today, the court proceedings are being taken by a stenographer. A stenographer takes by shorthand because the proceedings go so quickly. So we have to depend 100% on a stenographer of all the proceedings. Imagine we have been doing that for so long years. If the stenographer does something wrong, we have a major problem. Many cases it has been done, it, it has happened. When you take uh, something like uh, drugs, you know, you point uh, 0.75 grams and if you don't put the point, it becomes 75 grams and two grams or more, he's sentenced to jail and he's uh, sentenced to death. So a point, a point will change his whole life. So these are just examples I was trying to do, say. But this is the importance of making uh, the courts digital, making the courts easy for the lawyers, for the judges, for the people. Right? and the confidence and the international, international acceptance and the confidence of the people there over there would eat because we want to show that we are very straightforward. We are transparent. The government is spending a huge amount of money on this, totally handled by uh, the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of uh, Justice and Ministry of Technology. No interference at all. This is, I assure you, so this is one of the biggest project again that we are handling. There are 12 such projects that we are doing to make sure that this country, the, the government becomes very digitally friendly. Now, if I say before I go to my tip, uh, pet topic of techno parks, I will tell you what are the ingredients or what are the things that we have to do in parallel doing only the government will not work because this has been a major concern and a major problem for us. The, the government people or the public sector people should be in a position to ensure that the digitalization and the systems work in their own organization. Otherwise, it will never ever happen. So first of all, we have to take capacity. I, of course, feel it's more than capacity, it's talent. The talent that you have to build is, in my opinion, right? Just three to six months, you can bring a person easily into this level. Many of the projects that have failed is that you don't need and the public sector transfers really is a major problem for us. So we are starting a project called 500 CDIOs. We are going to train CIOs, 500 of them trained and ensure that they will run their organization. So under them, the Ministry of Technology would be conducting training packages for students, for graduates, for users, and the top civil servants. So they will all be able to handle and be able to have the confidence to use this, to give us ideas, to ensure they help us and to enhance the applications. I just had a, a, a discussion yesterday with the Grama Niladaris. What they know, I don't know. It's their system. We are enabling Grama Niladaris. We are giving 14,000 Grama Niladaris uh, uh, laptops and enabling 
them to integrate with our whole system because the grama niladari is the pivotal guy who starts from your birth to death is a very important person so he has normally about 32 such reports here so we are going from ground level from the public sector to the highest level of a secretary to ministers we are even training the minister the second thing that we have neglected a lot is the interconnections or the communications or whatever you call it right uh, trcl also i know oshada yesterday had a session with you most probably he would have discussed but this is the first time that we are going in a very big way enabling 4g by end of Dece uh, december end of next year we are computerizing or fiberization is done for 10250 schools so by next june all schools in this country would have fiber connections huge all funds available all plans laid out everything is ready every school in this country would have a fiber connection so it's it's extremely important that one should have the connections and the facility of telecom and interconnection in order for this to happen a policeman should be able to connect while on road in order if we want uh, the point system of the uh, 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 traffic point system to work so you would see the, these are not in isolation this is the problem that we had so obviously you have to understand the government public sector private sector you have slashcom fitis all these guys are working we are working very hard towards it a government public sector and private sector has a very cordial relationship today uh, we are going on that direction our private sector is very strong and then the capacity the education that i am not going to talk because there are two eminent spe speakers there are speakers who would talk about uh, the education but for us, it is extremely important that we build capacity and we build talent. So especially within the government, we are planning a huge program to ensure that every public sector employee is confident and is trained and should be, would be able to use all these soft software which are coming up uh, most probably next year. Uh, then comes my pet subject of Technopark. Uh, when you uh, when you're talking about techno parks please understand these are not it parks these are techno parks because uh, under the technology ministry nanotechnology biotechnology industrial technology they all come under the, uh, this particular uh, ministry that i'm handling so this was brought in together because one of the uh, areas that we can really do well is technology on especially on nano and bio. We are going ahead in a big way. We are investing huge amount of money on both areas, but it takes a little bit of time. But if I just take about the techno parks, today I would guarantee that these techno parks, five techno parks, namely in Gaul, Kurunagala, Kandy in Digana, Nuareli and Habarana, this will be beautiful setups with hard work, hard play, where we would give huge amount of recreational facilities for people to enjoy life and people to rotate amongst these technoparks. A person who comes to New Aurelia Technopark three months can come to Gaul for the next six months, can go to Digana, depending on his, on his requirements and his fancies. So there'll be huge amount of recreational facilities available inside this techno park. Technically, it will be acute by all fiber optic and 5G and superb uh, power supply, 24 hours operation, totally at any point where one a young guy could just, you know, during the day, he could do a lot of things, play, and in the night he can start working. So that type of flexibility we are bringing. There'll be swimming pools, there'll be, there'll be uh, tennis courts, there'll be 3D uh, film halls, uh, there'll be walking tracks, cycling tracks, you name it, we'll have it. So 
it's a matter where the young guys would come and enjoy with the family. So we are encouraging first time holiday workers from abroad because most of my colleagues, when I meet around, they say we come, we like to have a holiday working environment, right? So they let them come. Imagine you come to Kandy, Digana Techno Park is just next to the golf courts, uh, golf, uh, uh, Digana golf courts. And it's surrounded by the Victoria Lake. So we are bringing water sports. There'll be two, one runway and another uh, seaplane landing. A person who likes golf, you know, whether we like it or not, most of the foreign guys like to play golf, give them the facility. They go play golf in the evening, have a beer, come back, work. So this is the type of environment. A lot of people come and say, please understand now people don't want to work in office. So that's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm advocating. A people who don't walk, want to work in their offices can come and work in a, in a beautiful country and in an environment in Sri Lanka. Because you need only the laptop and a connection. So this is the concept that we are taking around giving them a lot of recreational. Habarana is going to be a fantastic place. Gaul, as you all know, is a beautiful area that we have taken just at the exit of the Colombo Gaul Highway. Kurnangal is so closed, it's just next to the Colombo Candy Highway, Kurnangal exit. So we have chosen in such a way that you too, Sri Lankans, would be able to work and enjoy and uh, this is going to be a huge, huge attraction. And I vouch and I assure you that this techno parks would be one of the best in the world. So we have already uh, talking to a lot of big boys. Three of them have already given the consent of them coming here. So this will bring not only expertise, this will bring experience, technology diffusion, plus knowledge diffusion to our young people who would like because if I just give an example, the Spain, the Spanish football, the Barcelona football, the Barcelona stadium, if one had gone, I was fortunate to visit there and be there. You know, the football brought the stadium or stadium made them footballers. That is the one that you have to think. And actually it's the other way. So when you have parks like this, facilities like this, we could actually drive our young guys, go into this field because all our techno parks are modular. We start with 12,500 and I believe within three to four years, we can make it 50,000. So encourage the people, encourage the people to work in foreign companies, in big companies and you know, as and when they want. So these are some of the areas that we are bringing just give me one minute just to say one of the other key areas is the law because this is extremely important. So the Cyber Security Act is in place. It will come out. It's at the cabinet, passed, and it will come out. This will give a lot of confidence to people because we have the Cyber Security Act. The Data Protection Bill has already been approved and it will, it will become a law very soon. This is extremely important for us. So this, these are also parallel we have adopted, we have brought in. So within just a small period of technology ministry, we have, we have addressed all these and brought in because none of this can survive in isolation. I, we believe that these are the ones that you would ensure that digital transformation for a technology-based economic revival, if you want, you have to go on a composite integrated system rather than in isolation where we have done. So I wish you all the very best and thank you for uh, allowing me to explain these matters to you. It is a privilege and I wish you all the very best and thank you again. Thanks, Jayanta. It was, it was very, even though I'm familiar with some of the concepts, but it's very refreshing to hear the progress that you have made uh, thus far in a very short period. And uh, uh, I'm sure there will be many questions during the Q&A time uh, that will come uh, uh, regarding the topic that you covered. Uh, thanks for covering the policy uh, framework. 
uh, also the uh, the digital infrastructure investments the government is planning also you alluded to the fact that an integrated uh, solution and approach is required uh, to achieve uh, uh, the government's vision uh, of a digitally uh, enabled economy thank you for that um, uh, so we move on to the next session which is of, uh, of the talent and the uh, digitally digitally enabled uh, education aspects of it so we have two eminent speakers, as I said, uh, mentioned earlier, covering this session. Um, we had two facets being covered in the next 25 minutes, uh, uh, digitalizing professional education and uh, digitalizing university education. So first to go is Hen uh, uh, Bandara on the, uh, digi uh, the digitalizing professional education. You have about approximately uh, 12 minutes to cover this topic, and then we will hand over the session the next session to uh, Professor Harendra Kariyasan. Over to you, Harendra uh, Kariyasan. Thank, Thank you, Chairman, uh, Co-Chairman, hello, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. As mentioned by Chairman, I have about uh, 10 to 12 minutes. And I will try my best to do the justice within the time allotted. When we talk about uh, digitalizing professional education, it may be worthwhile to mention on the technological disruption which took place decades ago. At that time, a famous uh, French economist said that technological disruption it's a good thing because if someone breaks your window, don't get angry, you can go for a new one. And as a result, the people who produce windows will get an income. This argument was that the disruption can always be used as a positive factor. Therefore, the pandemic is an opportunity and no exception to provide us the professional education. At the same time, digital transformation in professional education is not something that has started recently. It has been going on for a considerable period. The education providers gradually moved over to digitalizing of educational activities and have taken many initiatives. However, constraints such as devices, coverage related issues, lack of skill learning providers, lack of awareness, poor utilization of technology and lack of knowledge were identified as major barriers. With that, let me move on to my short presentation. I intend to cover the areas of what is digital, digital transformation? What does it mean for professional educational institutions? How has COVID-19 pandemic changed digital transformation? Recent development in technology and education the challenges of digital transformation in professional education and initiatives taken by CMA to improve the professional education. Let me start with uh, what is digital transformation and how can professional educational institution transform itself? We have already heard what digital transformation is. And I have given a simple definition to get an introduction to the digital transformation in professional education. So looking at professional institution, especially this part of the world, we can broadly look at transformation mainly in three areas. That is business processes, business model, and culture of the organization. 
what is important is that succeeding in building a technologically focused organization, which is essential to empower the organization to continue to grow. Technology, including its regular updates and innovation, requires a workforce that can easily adapt to changes and embrace a culture of continuous education. So what does it mean for professional educational institutions? It is commonly accepted that digital world requires professional educators to find new ways to incorporate and integrate technology into teaching practices. The professional educational institutions that manage this aspect stronger will naturally perform above others. If you consider today's business environment, professionals are required to solve new problems and use different modes of communication. Therefore, modern education must be focused on teaching those skills. At the same time, technology can also help reinvent professional education. This is delivered with new educational concepts such as blended learning and flipped learning. Let us now talk about how has the COVID-19 changed digital transformation. Basically, I would say that there are two aspects. What we have seen is that organizations with existing dig digital transformation programs have accelerated their digital agenda and roadmap. That is what exists. transformation program had to seriously look at these four survival. Therefore, professional education providers had to pay attention to their employees, students, invest in technology, prioritization of technology, and more importantly, weaving the technology to innovate and thrive. We will now look at what are the recent developments in technology and education. As you know, professional would continue to evolve and change with the growth of technology. This in turn has had a tremendous impact on the educational domain leading to several growing trends. Therefore, in order to engage their students properly, they must remain abreast of these latest changes and key factors that affect learning. One of the most important transformations we see is the usage of technology in teaching and learning. So that in this aspect, we can see a variety of media and tools that are available for enrich user experience for students. For example, there are many innovative online tools for note taking, mind mapping, et cetera. At the same time, professionals who want to remain competitive in the environment will need to constantly reskill themselves. Therefore, lifelong learning has become one of the major trends 
in professional education. The next area is the challenges of digital transformation in professional education. As you know, technology has already begun to penetrate the world of professional education for the past two decades. Many, many institutions already had a variety of different tools and system that they used to employ some limited form of technology. Unfortunately, since these systems were not used as an integrated system, many of the systems do not work well with each other, which creates a mismatch system across the institute, institutions. This is one of the main common challenges we see in professional educational institutions when they are trying to carry out digi digital transformation programs. The other challenges are a lack of clear strategy or direction for the digital adoption, incomplete knowledge of the skill needed to achieve meaningful digital adoption, people resistant to change and therefore it requires reskilling and upskilling at a scale never before. The final area that I would like to share with you is the initiatives taken by CMS Sri Lanka to improve the professional education member activities and internal working environment. CM is the first professional body in Sri Lanka to transform traditional exams into a computer-based evaluation, starting with first level. And in 2021, all of the four levels exams were also moved to computer-based evaluation, both online and center base. And more importantly, skill and support programs enriched and enhanced through digital platforms. In addition, we launched CMA virtual learning platform in order to support the students, especially during the pandemic period. At the same time, we had frequent digital interaction with learning partners and students to continue engagement and increase reachability. In addition to that, immediately after the pandemic, continuous professional development programs and member-related activities were moved to online, which increased the number of participation, access to more resource personnel, and number of programs offered. We were also able to increase the opportunities for members and students in overseas and fast track decision-making in all aspects of organizational management through increased collaboration on digital platform. The chairman, I think that I was able to manage the time they allotted to me. So thank you all, the chairman, over to you. Thank you, thank you Hinata, uh, for helping me out in finishing on time. And uh, I'm sure there'll be uh, ample time to discuss uh, some of the matters that you very succinctly uh, discussed on the uh, digitalization, the challenges on the professional education side. Uh, to move on to the digitalizing university education, let me invite uh, Prof uh, Professor Harendra Kariyasam uh, uh, to uh, uh, present his views. Okay, can I share the screen? Yes, you can. Okay. 
Okay, good afternoon, dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to address this conference on the digitalization of university education. Uh, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in dramatic changes in the world. The pandemic also had a severe impact on higher education because all these higher educational institutes had to close their premises in response to lockdown measures. In the previous session, Mr. Hennaika Bandara discussed the digitalization of professional education. So I'll be focusing on the digitalization of university education in this session. With the COVID-19 pandemic, the Sri Lankan government encouraged all universities to promote e-learning to ensure continuous university education. And I believe it is a very timely decision. There were online learning systems even before the COVID-19 pandemic, but it was not given priority in Sri Lankan higher education. However, the closure of universities as a result of COVID-19 has promoted digitalization of the education to a great extent. Now it has become an essential component of Sri Lankan university education. As you can see in this diagram, there are 17 universities, two campuses, 20 institutes, several external degrees and extension courses, recognized foreign universities under the University Grant Commission of Sri Lanka. I am happy to mention that all Sri Lankan universities quickly adapted to the e-learning process. In the beginning, it was very challenging for both the academics and undergraduates to face this situation with confidence. Still, there are several challenges such as connectivity issues, other technical issues, extreme weather conditions, etc. However, in times when changes appear, we need to find ways to adapt to these changes and overcome such challenges. Let me take my university, the University of Sri Jayavadhanapura, as an example. There are eight faculties, and all those faculties have ensured the continuity of education even with the lockdown, incorporating technology in offering online lectures as a substitute for physical lectures. If I consider my faculty, Faculty of Management Studies and Commerce, there are 12 departments and altogether there are around 5,000 undergraduates. The faculty has a separate learning management system which we refer to as the LMS for its undergraduates. For each course, there is a separate page in the LMS. You can see the LMS contains various options to facilitate online teaching, learning, and assessments. The faculty provides training on different aspects of the LMS regularly. During the pandemic, we usually upload recorded lectures to the LMS and then we conduct an online session to clarify students' questions. Or else we do the lectures online and later upload the lecture recording to the LMS. All other learning materials, additional readings, announcements are also available on the LMS and students are required to regularly check their limits. It is like the main mode of communication between lecturers and undergraduates. Integration of technology in the education process also creates pathways to meet the unique needs of students as individual learners. Especially university students have to undergo an internship period while being undergraduates. Due to different reasons, some students are engaged in part-time jobs while they are studying. The digitalization of university education is a good solution for such practical matters 
faced by the students. Because they can attend the virtual session from wherever they are. Therefore, even after the situation becomes normal, e-learning can be continued for the benefit of such students. At the University of Sri Jayawardenepura, there are remote access to library resources for all faculties. So students can access electronic database outside the university premises, which are useful for their online studies. Hence, students can access MRL, JSTOR, Taylor and Francis, Oxford Journals, and Oxford Medicine online databases. Today, all the national universities in Sri Lanka have improved to the state of holding examinations in a virtual platform successfully. These days, the Faculty of Management Studies and Commerce of the University of Sri Jayawardenepura conducts online examination for the students with proper guidelines and instructions given to face an online examination properly minimize the practical issues. You can see some of the guidelines given in the presentation. They are mock examination arranged to practice both the students and the lecturers to adapt to the process. We know some students are suffering from COVID-19 or under quarantine. So our faculty decided to conduct makeup exams for such students. Nowadays, the challenges to access online learning are less because both students and lecturers have been experienced the excellent opportunity of knowing and interest in uh, interacting with educational technology tools such as mobile-based learning, computer-based learning, and web-based learning. It is always easy for us to work with Generation Z because the new generation is always technically updated. They get adopted to new environments faster than us because they were grown up with technology. However, university life cannot be limited only to education. There are so much more like sports, clubs, associations, events, get togethers, etc. Students learn and get life experiences from those things also. So we should not forget that these undergraduates are missing a lot of things due to the replacements of in-person education with virtual education, loss of social interaction with lecturers, friends, and peers, engaging of extracurricular activities, and virtual graduation replacing in-person ceremonies. According to recent research, this dramatic shift in lifestyle have created a parallel pandemic, which is the psychosocial burden of COVID-19 in the younger generation. Since we don't have an option at the moment, we have to move forward with the technology. The digitalization of university education requires establishing an appropriate plan for technological infrastructure facilities and technical and service support. Undergraduates should be provided learning support, such as technical support and educational guidance to use technological tools usefully for their learning. So it is important to equip them with technical skills like cloud computing, artificial intelligence, matching, uh, machine learning, productivity, the university should also empower students to be ready with 21st century skills like teamwork, communication, critical thinking, and creativity. The academic staff has a crucial role. Therefore, universities should provide continuing professional development to them as well. The government also ha has a huge responsibility to enhance infrastructure to facilitate the education. We always focus on the impact of COVID-19 on our economy, 
but there is a significant impact is on education too. This pandemic can be considered as a call to renew our commitments to achieve a better sustainable future in higher education adapting to the new normal. So I hope that everyone will embrace the challenges we face and get adapted to a new ways of digitalizing the higher education process. Thank you and please stay safe. Thank you, Professor Harendra. That was very insightful. And uh, within this time allocated, you covered uh, uh, the key aspects of the opportunities and challenges uh, in the, uh, the new uh, uh, way of de delivering uh, education in the current context. Uh, let me move on to the, the final presenter, Ms. Ajit Salgado, um, as a group CIO Sampath Bank, uh, on the impact of digital transformation on the banking sector. Over to you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Chanda. Uh, can you see my presentation, uh, Chanda? If you right, can put okay. it on uh, presentation. Yes, mode. we can see. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yes, perfect. Good. Um, Professor Watawala, um, let me start my video as well. Uh, Professor Watawala, uh, Chairman and Co-Chairman, uh, and panel of speakers. The future of banking is predominantly decided by how close the bank is to the customer's life cycle. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, in my 20 minutes presentation, maybe 20 to 25 minutes presentation, I will take you through some key aspect in digital transformation and creating an impact in the banking industry. And then how digitalization has progressed in banking amid these time, trying times and also what are the next steps that we can take uh, to do the digitalization in the banking. Right. So starting from uh, late 1980s, Sri Lankan banking industry has evolved rapidly because of technology. ATMs in 1988, credit card, phone banking, internet banking, payment gateway, NFC, biometrics, which have made customers and bankers live easy. Today we are in the digital era. In fact, Sri Lanka has shown more innovative banking concept in its market, more than most developed countries or even the region. Right, uh, the digital transformation. So not only in banking, but many industries are looking towards different disruptive technologies to achieve growth, operational excellence, and sustainability. There are seven major areas or technologies that are being contributed to the digital transformation. It may be banking, it may be other industries as well. So artificial intelligence, and robotic process automation helps to transfer repetitive and stressful work to the machines. So leaving humans to involve more creative and artistic pastimes. And then IoT or internet of things will keep different objects or appliances connected for our convenience. As an example, even smartphone, wearable devices, connected health, etc. So with the advancement of technologies such as 5G, these technological miracles would be commonplace right now. 
so you could undergo a surgery even performed by a doctor residing in another country another continent even and then uh, when we come to the blockchain the blockchain technology will be picked in many industries not only in banking many industries central bank of sri lanka recently carried out a proof of concept using blockchain to share our kyc know your customer data among the banks and the other technology most important technology for bank is omni channel so omni channel platform are used to give uninterrupted seamless experience to the customers across different channel because you know banks we have many channels so this is the seamless uh, experience uh, given to customers through this uh, omni channel and digital currencies it is the hot topic in the market digital currencies are starting to pick up especially with the initiative of central bank digital currencies by some countries even our, our neighbor reserve bank of india it is the same as central bank in sri lanka has already announced their roadmap to cbdc otherwise the digital currencies so the digital wallet now everyone has physical wallet now it is converting into a digital wallet so digital wallet are picking up again due to the convenience of using online payment day to day transactions and the lifestyle activities and the other one is the the data science the data science is an essential area to support the entire digital journey of a bank to understand the customers to offer customers and potential customers with new offering maybe a loan maybe a proposal for an investment maybe a personal or personalized offering so for that we need to have a data science so with the data science we can get the insight of customers and then we'll move on to the the results so digital transformation results so whatever the technology whatever the plan every step need to be focused on results otherwise it is meaningless so rather than trying to do everything together or without waiting for a big result at the end a clear road map is essential which give results during the journey maybe as quick wins right transformation trends of a typical bank promote into digital transformation this is the live example of one bank so let's look at this example a successful bank promoting digital would have started transforming their manual transaction into digital so as a part of their long term journey of course creating a major impact because they are reducing their human cost and human involvement and increasing or the transferring those transactions into the online based transaction so you can see the red line in the graph showing manual transaction has gone down while the blue line has grown rapidly so majority of the manual transaction have been taken over by digital form a complete change over and and a huge cost saving especially in the human resources so uh we need to have a departure from the traditional mindset of once the all 
rigid set of you know product and services to fulfill a definite set of customer requirement so rather digital transformation is an involving that means the involving with all the people and it is a evolving process to offer digital experience to meet lifestyle of their requirement not their basic requirement their lifestyle requirement not the banking requirement not the accounting requirement their lifestyle requirement i'm repeating this because that is the main attraction main experience for the future customers and banks should be ready to revise the solution more often or quickly it should be dynamic it should be agile it should be more quickly we should be able to change their uh, solution or the offering so digital readiness so if banks are to keep up the this fast evolving digital environment they must adapt new operating model and uh, place a greater focus on user experience especially what users are requesting so convenience versus security products while enhancing the convenience strengthening security is also paramount important that is a reality paradox just imagine about your home how many locks do you have before you enter into your home probably the gate and the main door so if you re- if you need to add more security you may add to more doors more locks so this surely take away your convenience so that is the convenience we need to strike a balance between convenience and security so digitalization and automation these are the two end so people think that digitalization is some kind of automation no does automation mean digitalization no even no the often see situation where these two get mix up but simply converting something into a you know digital or the um, automated from the manual just a straight forward you know automation is called automation that is what we have been doing over the period of time but in digital era it is something different in fact trying to convert existing processes and legacy system is one of the main reason why digitalization attempt to often fail or make significant losses because they go through the automation process but sustainable methodology is to approach digital transformation with a complete new operating model so we need to do the business transformation together with digital transformation or the computer transformation it is a business reengineering process not just a automation and pandemic was the greatest catalyst for digital transformation of course so well uh, covid 19 is the worst situation we all even the entire globe went through in the recent past our economy is under tremendous pressure however one good thing we see in covid 19 is it accelerated the digital transformation by several years the effort being put by many banks to get the people into the digital started realizing immediately earlier we were going behind the customers to give digital product now the customers and the merchant the suppliers they are demanding digital product 
transaction trend of uh, the banking industry. So because of this, uh, if we look at the transaction trend uh, of different channels in Sri Lanka, according to the CBSL data, you can see the blue line, ATMs and orange line costs has declined during 2020. Internet banking, e-commerce, and mobile banking has gradually picked up. You can see the difference because of the pandemic. And channel-wise transformation, uh, the, 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 the channel distribution of a bank who promote digital transfer, this is the real example. So now you are looking at a graph showing the channel distribution of a bank who promoted digital uh, transformation. This is the real, real data. So see the manual transaction going drastically down the red line with ATMs. The purple and line, the ATM is the purple line and the post is the brown line and uh, the yellow line is uh, an orange line. Online banking, e-commerce have picked up during the year 2020. So you can see the uh, difference. You can see the difference because of the pandemic, the people are demanding the, 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 the digital transaction, the bank and the other industries also, they are trying to digitalize because to, you know, uh, give this, uh, offer this, their services through the digitalized environment. Uh, accelerated uh, digitalization with uh, COVID-19. Uh, customers, employees, and stakeholders of banks were benefited by digitalization during the pandemic. Ordering essential, you know, online items, getting essential financial need through online banking, virtual meetings like this, uh, work from home arrangement, essential procurement arrangement through online, supplies, so on the list can continue. Even some banks held the annual general meeting virtually first time to save the you know considerable amount of money compared to previous occasions. Simulated uh, cyber crimes. So while being uh, victorious on uh, digital acceleration, so we need to uh, be cautious on a dark side. Simulated cyber crime. So we need to pay attention and act carefully on this. The increase of activities and traffic on digital trans platform on uh, create increased opportunities for hackers. The more digitalized environment, it's uh, some kind of opportunity for hackers unless you have a right security technology. Then some hackers are also even they are working from home, hackers. They start enjoying their hobby at home. They have more time. Things like, you know, fake funding raise, sometimes among even legitimate fundraising activities going on. If we, if we are aware of such situation and necessary strengthening of security is done properly. So that is what we need to be careful as a, you know, the IT people. Because the business people, they know only the, the delivery part. It is not just, uh, you know, delivery through an app or web. There is a underlying technology behind this app and web. It is included this entire security network. There are so many different lines, even especially for bank. And plan for digital 
now coming back to the digital transformation how we do we uh, leverage on this situation so without waiting uh, for everyone to be perfect so everything to be settled set the roadmap by prioritizing area identify the key customer journeys and choose the most appropriate technology at the moment the plan for quick wins without waiting for end of the digital roadmap to see the big results so uh, digital inclusion more and more people are getting access to digital according to trc sri lanka 20 million broadband connection and 30 million mobile subscription including uh, data only subscription uh, active by this year maybe uh, the um, 2021 and digital inclusion uh, again uh, the we get the support from regulator cbsl is actively promoting digital year 2020 was the name as the, the digital year for central bank uh, another prominent example is revised regulation of non phase to phase uh, kyc uh, with the uh, to the uh, you know support of online uh, onboarding the customers account opening online uh, so with this some bank have already started onboarding or the opening account uh, for their new customers while the customers are in a convenient their place maybe residing at home so uh, to wrap up my session uh, so yesterday's big word are today's common language the disruptive uh, uh, growth of social um, social uh, trust in digital banking and finance would push bank to achieve higher level of efficiency 2020 will be a decisive year for integration of digital technologies in bank yes sorry the the momentum achieved in digital with covid will continue definitely continue with another one or two years so we need to get the maximum advantage of that because the, in this case we don't want to push the digital um, transaction digital um, initiative but it is demanded by the customers or the clients the key is to move towards synergy between digital channel and human touch so we need to strike a balance between that as well so thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to me uh, i think uh, during the q and a i am more than happy to answer questions from you thank you over to chairman thanks sajid that was a very comprehensive presentation thank you for that i'm conscious of time i know we are about time uh, ruchira do you have time for q and a or is it uh, uh, chand yeah we can take up some questions chand eh? some questions have come from the audience uh, shall we take those questions up first sure go ahead uh, this question i think may be answered by jayant or ajit uh, uh, one person is asking about the privacy of data privacy and security of data when we are using these apps uh, especially i think maybe when you are using bank in apps uh, this person is uh, questioning how can we ensure privacy and security of data maybe ajit can answer this question yeah thank you uh, ruchira the the privacy or the privacy is paramount important when you come to the even the bank the 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 trust of banking system is based on the privacy if you lose the you know privacy that is the end of banking so that the uh, when we have our own data at the you know our data center so without uh, disclosing to the you know through the many channels to the customers we have more security now it is the era that we are opening up banking to the society as i said it is a, you know the lifestyle banking 
So we need to go to the lifestyle of the customer so that we need to open. The no sooner you open, so there are so many channels that the data can be shared. But as a bankers, not only even the bankers, but in other industries also, even the Jayanta can explain, it is very important to secure the data. But in the banking sector, so we have taken all the necessary steps to secure the data. And even the central bank side, I know that I'm closely working with the central bank also, they are preparing whatever the guidelines, whatever the, the controls, and even the act is now is being prepared. And uh, even according to Jayanta, it's a cyber security act also uh, here. And all these, you know, the not only the, you know, the securing from the technicality, so we need to have all kind of, you know, um, um, all kind of uh, areas to be strengthened. That means the, the ownership of the data and the, the governing laws and the controls and the technical. The technical pass can be, uh, can be you know, easily implemented. But uh, once we have uh, you know, close data, we need to open up the data to use the data. When we use the data, we need to have certain control. So control should be uh, governed by law and regulation as well. I think Jayanta can answer about the, the governing part of that. Yeah, Jayanta, now before you, you answer that question, now some one person is asking about the legal framework. Do we have a legal framework for this to protect privacy? And also he is asking that data protection yes. bill has been gathering dust for nearly 20 years. Any views on this? Yes, I would. I would kindly. You are asking me, or I didn't get you. I I think Jayanta, you can answer this question. Yes. Yeah. Can you repeat the question, please? I'm at another meeting. Sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I will repeat the question. Yeah. He's asking about the data protection. Whether we have a legal framework in Sri Lanka? What has happened to the Data Protection Act? Yeah, Data Protection Act is the, itself is the legal framework. So we are putting that it has gone to the cabinet. And then after that, we have to form another body, which actually looks after it's a huge, uh, huge mechanism. So there will be another body who would actually oversee this. So very distinguished people of this country, like retired chief justices, uh, people like that. Uh, we'll have form a committee and then they would actually monitor and look after that. So that is how the Data Protection Act would come. Right. We have taken yes. all in international conditions. We have talked to many other countries. We have talked to large companies in the world uh, and, uh, you know, and framed this. So uh, it has gone through many iterations. And uh, now it's uh, approved and now we are again, uh, you know, we have to do a few things. But after that, uh, the data protection, uh, the bill is at the moment, bill, it's in the form of a bill. But once it is coming as act, then after that, it will uh, actually uh, have a, a top player which actually monitors, control, enhance, all that will be done by then. We will not get involved here. Yeah. Thanks, Jayanta. Thanks for that answer. So this question is regarding, there are two questions regarding the edu education aspects. So one person is asking, uh, can we expect an increase in university intake in future with more online courses? The pandemic has shown us the way forward in uni education and it is a good opportunity to self-manage the university funding as well. Uh, Professor Harendra, uh, what do you think about this? Yeah, do you yes, think that, that it will help the university yeah, intake? That's in a good question. Yeah. Mm. That's a good question. I think we can consider these options in future. That's right. So you think that will help the university intake in the future? It will help increase yeah, the definitely, intake in the definitely. future. Yes. Yes. So, Professor, in the same in the same light, now there's another question. Yeah. Uh, now, in your presentation, also you have been discussing about the facilities for the university students in order to continue yes. the online education. So, what can you tell about this? Now, most of the students. Now, in Jayanta's presentation, he said now the countries, uh, country has taken steps to provide fiber facilities for all the schools in Sri Lanka. So, in in this light, Professor, I would like to ask from you: 
uh, what kind of facilities do we need to provide for university students in order to promote the online education? Yes. Uh, you may have to conclude after this, okay? Okay, okay, brother. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so that's a good question. Not all university students own digital devices. However, to help such university students, the Sri Lankan government introduced a laptop loan scheme. Mm -hmm. It's a special offer that provides an interest a free bank loan to all government university students to buy a computer of their choice. So yeah. there is a huge responsible, responsible for the government to facilitate students with digital devices. On the other hand, students mostly use technology for entertainment and communication. They mm -hmm. don't have much experience in using technology for learning. So yes. providing technical support and guidance to use technological tools for their learning is a must. Fine. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Arsa. Maybe Chan, we can wrap up. Uh, wrap, wrap it up. Sure. sure, thank you. I think it has been a very interesting session and I wish we had more time for Q&A, but I think uh, uh, I want to thank all the uh, speakers uh, who joined today. I think Jayantha uh, uh, alluded to the fact that the government is uh, accelerating the digital journey of the uh, supporting the key components of the economy. Uh, he looked at the digital infrastructure investment that is required, the human capital aspects of change management to make change stick where chief digital officers are being uh, trained and invested in by the government. He also alluded to the fact that the integrated approach uh, uh, to digital transformation, the economy is required. Uh, that therein the, the digital ID uh, project, uh, digitizing from the grassroots, from the grammar savers, is important for the economy to sustain itself. Uh, and also the the talent aspects of it was alluded to. So I think uh, we uh, also he alluded to the fact that the enabling regulatory framework is now being expedited, uh, and and that will also play a, a big role in accelerating uh, the digital backbone of the economy. Uh, and some of the infrastructure developments to enable the export, uh, such as the tech parks, uh, and, um, uh, uh, is also happening uh, concurrently. So that was very hard thing to note. On the education side, uh, I think uh, we had uh, two panelists who spoke about the professional education side as well as the university education side, uh, the challenges that were faced and also opportunities. Uh, and, and therein lies uh, uh, the, uh, the, for the leadership of the professional body such as CMA, there's opportunity to invest and to take in uh, technology to accelerate uh, the student experience as well as uh, providing more opportunities in the university system. Whilst there are advantages uh, of scale and delivery, uh, there is also challenges in terms of the overall uh, rounded uh, experience the students get in the university system when they interact with people in terms of problem solving, leadership, and relationship building uh, skills. So that's the opportunity, the challenge that was presented, and finally. Ajit spoke about the, 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 uh, the digital transformation in the financial service sector, the difference between automation and transformation and how it presents significant opportunities uh, even in, uh, in the uh, cryptocurrency space and how uh, uh, the space is evolving in the region. So uh, I think thank you to all the panelists and it was a very interesting session. I'm sure some of the, uh, 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 the insights shared will be taken on by uh, the, the CMA leadership to uh, look at uh, follow-up actions uh, and enabling uh, the growth uh, in the sector. Uh, thank you and over to you. Uh, um, uh, thank, you thank you. Thank you, Janna. I think uh, uh, we are extremely uh, uh, happy that you have uh, conducted a very, very excellent uh, uh, and I think the most important thing of digital transformation and uh, the need for a technology-based economic revival. I'm very happy uh, that uh, this will really show the way in all aspects that we've seen. So uh, the two additional minutes you have taken, I'm sure is really worthwhile. And uh, let me thank everyone, including of course, Rajanta, Purga Harendra, uh, Ruchira, uh, uh, Hennaik, uh, uh, Ajit, and all of them for the great performance uh, that they have. So thank you and uh, thank you. Uh, look forward to uh, be in touch with you in order that uh, we could take forward what you have spoken to. Thank you and all the very best. Thank pleasure, you, brother. Thank, thank, thank you to all. Very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank and also, you. thank uh, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, uh, we have finished the session three. I'm sorry that uh, we are a little delayed on uh, session four, but uh, I think uh, your session we are giving you a little more time as earlier. Uh, others were uh, maybe 90 minutes, but you have been given 120 minutes. Uh, so let me uh, start. Uh, uh,
as soon as possible. So uh, take position four that uh, will be on responses to COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. So this session uh, would be chaired by uh, Professor Samanthi Senaratna. I think she's here. Uh, let me briefly introduce before I can hand over to her. Professor Samanthi is a senior professor in accounting of the Department of Accounting, University of Sri Javadanapura, Sri Lanka. She holds a bachelor's uh, honors degree in accounting with a first class an MBA and a PhD specializing in finance. She is a prolific researcher and has published widely in the area of corporate governance, corporate sustainability, accounting and integrated reporting. In fact, she is one of our judges on our CMA excellence in integrated reporting awards and has been working very closely with us and accounting education, both uh, locally and internationally. She has also won many awards in recognition of her research work and participated as a panelist in various local and international forums on accounting education and integrated reporting. She actively engages in curriculum development and quality assurance of activities of universities. Uh, I must also say that uh, she is also uh, one of our members uh, on our CMA uh, Sri Lanka Academic uh, uh, Board. I'm very happy that uh, we are having her today. So let me uh, hand over to uh, her to Samant uh, Samanti, but before that, I just want to maybe welcome uh, two of them whom I have specially invited, uh, uh, Mr. Deepal Suryachi, who is going to speak on a very, very special topic of mindfulness practices, and of course, Ms. Media Mariam Riza. Uh, may I congratulate you on receiving the CMA Excellence in uh, Business Award uh, uh, on Emotional Intelligence, and of course, Hasita on the CFO's response. So over to you, uh, Professor Samant. Right. Uh, thank you, Professor Vatavala. I hope I'm audible enough. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. okay. So I think uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Vatavala, for the kind introduction given to me. Uh, I welcome all of you to the last technical session of the National Management Accounting Conference organized by CMA Sri Lanka. Though this is the last session, this is, it focuses on a very important and a timely issue. That is the responses to be made to COVID-19 pandemic and aftermath. So I think I should appreciate first CMA Sri Lanka for identifying such important issue to end the proceedings of the conference. So all of you would agree with me that we are in a crucial juncture of the human history. So this COVID pandemic, 19 pandemic is a multifaceted crisis in my opinion. So we are facing many issues, not only in Sri Lanka, all over the world. So we cannot think all the countries or have been affected by this pandemic and also the people of those countries have been affected. So we can see the poverty levels have increased, people have lost jobs, uh, income levels have reduced, uh, the international trade is affected, uh, tourism has been drastically impacted, the school children are out of the schools for nearly one year. Uh, there are so many such hard facts we can see, but beyond the hard facts, there are many uh, human related aspects which are associated with this pandemic the increasing stress levels of people, loss of human touch due to uh, lockdowns, travel restrictions, etc. The Im Im emotional imbalances that people face owing to this uh, isolation, the loss of contact with others. Uh, there are, and also there are uh, domestic violence related issues, gender issues. So we can see there are many human related issues in relation to this pandemic. And we have also realized that the lockdowns and the travel restrictions alone will not resolve this pandemic. Therefore, now it is the high time for us to think safe coexistence with the COVID-19 pandemic and develop social and economic recovery process to, work, uh, to face this pandemic and the situation post pandemic era. So that is the very purpose of this final session of the CMA's National Management Accounting 
conference. So with that uh, background information about the session, let me take this opportunity to introduce the co-chairman and the three eminent panelists who will talk to you about this recovery process. They will share their thoughts and experiences to uh, find solutions and improve our human uh, side, the physical issues, the mental issues that we faced in relation to the pandemic. So firstly, the co-chairman of this session is Mr. J.M.U.B. Jayasekara. He needs no introduction to SEMA fraternity, but still as a matter of, uh, uh, as a formality, let me introduce uh, Mr. Jayasekara. He's a council member of CMA Sri Lanka, and also a former president of AAT Sri Lanka. And he has also served in the council of CA Sri Lanka over eight years. He holds a bachelor's degree in business management from University of Sri Jayavadhanapura. He is also a fellow member of CA Sri Lanka, AT, CMA Sri Lanka. Presently, he is the chairman of JMC Jayasekara Management Center. Then, our three renowned uh, speakers. Firstly, Mr. Deepal Suryadachi. Chartered marketer and a management consultant. He's a trainer, author, speaker, and accredited master coach and mentor. Deepal was the former managing director of Aviva MVB Insurance. He's a corporate leader with the proven track record. He has over 30 years of experience in marketing, HRM, and general management. Further, he has authored 15 books in English and Sinhala covering a range of areas, business to Buddhism. Then comes uh, Ms. Miriam Riza, uh, President, Intergenerational Consultancy, Wattleshire Private Limited, Australia. I hope I pronounced the word correctly. Mariam is an award-winning intergenerational strategist and international speaker on human capital engagement. She builds strategies to engage differing generations in business to harness undervalued talent potential in organizations and people. So she also lectures in areas of ethics, governance, and sustainability for both academic and professional programs. And she's a widely sought out uh, speaker at international conferences and summits. Uh, then last but not the least, Mr. Hasita Premaratna. Hasita is the group finance director of Bandix Group. He leads the overall finance function of the group and also the strategy and long range planning of Brandings. Uh, Hasita is a fellow member of the of CMA UK, ACCA UK, and CMA Sri Lanka. So Hasita is also involved in lecturing for professional accounting programs, and he is a well recognized lecturer. So he has won many awards. Among them, he is a winner of the. Tutor of the Year Award, SIMA Global Financial Management Awards 2009, and SIMA Star of the Year Award in 2012. So with that uh, introduction, let me invite the three speakers to present their thoughts and experiences as to the recovery process of COVID-19, the economic and social recovery. So let me invite first Deep, Mr. Deepal Suryalachi to deliver his speech. Deepal, over to you. Uh, how many minutes I should I take? 25 minutes. Okay, right. Thank you, and uh, it's a privilege to be among the, such an eminent uh, panel of experts, and uh, thank you for that introduction. Thanks, Dr. Lakshman, for inviting me. Uh, can I share my screen? Uh, uh, yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Well, yeah, he can. Yeah. Yes. I'll share a few slides so that it is easy for me to uh, navigate the uh, discussion. Uh, I will try to uh, 
give you a flavor of mindfulness and how it can uh, help in this uh, uh, stressed period of time. Let me first share a story. This is something that happened at, during the first uh, lockdown, the, as the things were heating up in Sri Lanka. This person uh, woke up in the middle of the night, feeling uh, feverish. He uh, tried to swallow. He could feel uh, an irritating thought. And he walked up, went to the kitchen, uh, drank some hot water, but it didn't ease the situation. He slowly walked back to his bed and now he's lying down. He uh, felt that he has contracted COVID. Then he thought, oh, what will happen? In the morning, I will have to be taken to IDH. And uh, I, he thought I would wish to my, I should wish my family goodbye, but I cannot do that. I shouldn't be sharing the disease. So I will, I cannot do a farewell before I go. And when I go there, I will stay alone and I will not have access to my family. And if things go worst, uh, then I will be dead. And then he visualized himself getting donated that IDH uh, symmetry. Uh, so that was the image that came. And at a presentation, when I related this story as a precursor to my presentation, immediately after the session, somebody called me and said, Deepal, how did you know my story? I said, what story? The story that you related, and I'm going through that. So I thought this is a good real life example for us to explore what we are going through and how we can use a technique called mindfulness in order to uh, overcome this uh, situation. This is because our mind has the innate capability to design, develop, and direct films. Actually, we are very good movie directors. During the day, how many movies do we direct? Some are horror stories, some are pornographic stories, some are detective stories. You know, you know better. All of us do this. Actually, this is an ability that we have acquired probably during evolution, from animal to uh, human being, as a survival tool, right? Uh, to link the past to the present and present you project into the future. This is what we do. So this really doesn't happen in the same way with animals. Now, where does fear come from? Right? Uh, now, you may have experienced probably being chased by your dog or something. And then uh, you got scared. Now, why did you get scared? Was it to the dog or to the thought that the dog will bite you and it will hurt you and it will, you know, you might get pedophobia uh, and things like that. It's the thought of uh, consequences that create fear, not really the dog itself. Now, see, uh, animals have a different way of tackling this, right? For example, you have seen in uh, movies this. Uh, like uh, Animal Planet and things like that, how predators chase their prey, like deers. And then the moment the predator is not there, the deer would go back to eat. He, would, he was grazing and he would go back to eat. But we cannot do that. We continue to think about it. All right, will it happen again? And, you know, that is because of this habit, ability to do that. So we constantly think about it. Now, this is the fundamental root cause for stress. Because we keep thinking of the same thing over and over again, we ruminate, and that exacerbates the situation. Usually, this happens when we are faced with a challenge, a challenge of a 
challenge to a position or challenge when there are not enough uh, resources to uh, meet, whether it is financial, whether it is uh, knowledge, whether it is people, whether it is time. Now, when you think the challenge is bigger than the resources I have, we think we are small and the challenge is big. Our oldest part of our brain, you know, decodes this as if, as if our survival is at uh, risk. Then what happens is we try to imagine all the possible outcomes that can come in the future. Or we bring some things in from the past and think, oh, I shouldn't have done that, you know, see what happened and things like that, and you cannot correct. So therefore, uh, this combination of challenge and rumination creates this feeling of, I cannot handle this. This is how the stress builds up in your system. This is first psychologically, and then it becomes physically, then it becomes psychologically. It can even reach levels of uh, serious status, which requires expert advice. So common sense tells, okay, if you can break that cycle of thinking over and over again, right, you might be able to get out of it. Whenever you listen to somebody who is in a big crisis situation, in a problem, you can always experience the way they relate to the problem. They keep thinking it over and over and again, come back to the same thing, right? So this is the whole process that we are going through. So, so I'm trying to see whether we can break this cycle. Of course, if you can just drop this, for a short while. Pick up something from your table, maybe a small piece of paper, and just hold it with a stretched hand for three minutes. What happens? Initially, it is not heavy. It's not heavy, really, technically, but if you keep holding it, your arm begins to hurt. So the only thing you can do is can you drop it down for a short while. So this is exactly what we need to do, like a safety valve in a machine, right, to prevent continuously going through this cycle. Let me give another example to say how when you apply that, what happens. I'm sure most of you remember the case where these uh, young Thai students who went in an exploration of this underground cave and uh, they got trapped and they were there for a long time. And uh, until the international rescue teams uh, went there, it was there for a couple of days. Now they expected to meet some devastated children, but what they met, what they found was a bunch of quite happy, uh, uh, I would say they were not happy and jubilant, but they were not that much stressed. They were fairly sensible a bunch of people. So how did it happen? Fortunately for these children, they had a teacher who had learned this art of mindfulness, which is not worrying about the past and not fearing about the future, but staying focused in the present moment. And he got these kids to do that. And that's how they kept these children in a fairly stable frame of mind. And after they were recovered, none of them went through what people know as a post-traumatic stress disorder. They just get back to normal. So you can see this is something that is really beneficial. And this is possible for a simple reason that in our mind, thoughts come one after the other. At any given thought moment, there's only one thought. It comes, then something else comes, something else comes. Some thoughts get built upon on it, one on the other. And this is the way the mind works. And what we are going to use is this particular mind behavior itself to uh, come out of these situations. 
So in a normal situation, what we do is when there's a stimuli come to our two senses, we react. But if you become aware, then you respond. You will realize this is a capability that all of us have in some form. Sometimes you realize what you did after many hours or even days, oh, I shouldn't have done it that way. Sometimes you realize it halfway through, like for example, you are in a conversation in the lunchroom and you suddenly realize, no, I shouldn't be telling this, you wriggle yourself out. Or you realize just before, like for example, a parent would say with a, with a child, uh, say, I know what to do if it is not here. So it means pa parent were angry. The suddenly she, the parent became aware and he, res he or she responded instead of reacting. So this is this capability of our being able to become aware that we are going to build up in this process of developing mindfulness. So in simple, what we do is we bring the attention to the present moment and observe without getting involved because we are conditioned to get involved all the time. If we like something, we want more of it. If we don't like something, we want to reject. So this is the whole process. So this is a skill like cycling, like swimming, like anything. You keep practicing, you can be a master of it. Right? And truly, fortunately, this is coming from Odisha. It is called Sati Sampajani. But what we are using is the basic of this called Sati Matra or just the introduction to Sati. And this, of course, in the uh, early 2000s, this became quite interesting to the scientific community. And they did a lot of research to find out uh, what happens to people who practice mindfulness as a serious practice. And then they figured out there's definite uh, benefits which can be monitored. As a result, this practice of mindfulness from the uh, monasteries of the East went to classrooms and companies and hospitals and prisons. And in, in England, even the parliament passed a law which says the mindful nation. So there are the proven benefits of uh, this in the psychological field and there's a lot of literature if you want to refer, right? And uh, in schools, they use it uh, to, to, to uh, get uh, children's attention improved, right? Uh, uh, it's just a simple example, right? Uh, one school where the kids were coming from very uh, stressed backgrounds, uh, the chief teacher would get them to lie down on the ground in the morning, keep a teddy bear on the lap, uh, on the tummy, and ask them to watch the uh, what happens to the teddy bear. Teddy bear goes up, teddy bear comes down, teddy bear goes up, teddy bear comes down with the breath. And when you start watching that, you become present moment not in the future, not in the past. So I told you this is a skill. Now skills cannot be discovered by listening to, and why don't I take the next three minutes to get you to start experiencing what I'm talking about being present in this moment, right? So just adjust your seat, sit comfortably, bring your attention to your body, gently close your eyes and try to notice all the sensations. What do you feel? How are you seated? How do you feel? Can you feel your feet? Can you feel your knees? Can you feel your legs? And uh, And experience, and experience the uh, uh, sensations.
Now, see whether you can hear any sounds. And look for the thoughts that pop up in your mind. And if it is nothing to this moment, let them go. When doing that, you might notice that you're breathing. See whether you can pay attention to your breath without any effort. Just notice. No effort, no interference. And if your mind goes somewhere or if something else comes up, see whether you can notice your breath again. Take a deep breath and open your eyes while exhaling. So this is a simple process. This is a simple process. And you can keep trying this at any moment of your day. You can, you can drink a cup of tea with that. While waiting for lift, you can do that. And, you know, whatever the normal moment of your life, you can keep trying this. And then what happens, you integrate the skill to your life. So once you do that, then you learn to let, become aware of what happens here and now. And uh, you become aware of what goes on. You can uh, let go of uh, what happens. And eventually, you will notice your intentions. So once you know why you're doing certain things, you become a more insightful person. So this is a simple introduction to this practice of mindfulness. And these are the books you don't want to read. But the most important book is yourself. So thank you. That's what I wanted to share. And I hope it was a short introduction, but useful. Right, thank you, uh, Deepal. But perhaps we can take uh, questions and answers uh, at the oh, yeah. final round. Uh, huh? At the end. At the end. Yes. At the end. Yeah. Okay. So then we can, the audience can raise all three speakers, and after that, they will raise the questions. Exactly. Right. So okay. I invite the audience to be ready with their questions. You can use either the chat option or the QA option for that purpose. Thank you, Deepal, for the interesting presentation on mindfulness. Now, let me invite Mariam Reza to discuss with you about yet another important aspect, emotional intelligence. Over to you, Maria. Thank you so much, Professor Samanti, and uh, welcome everybody to the CMA conference. I'm always excited to be here, and I do have to thank uh, Professor Lakshman for the invitation as well, all the time. I really, it's, a, it's an honor working with, with you and your team as well, all the time. Um, so what I thought I'll do today is, we've all heard about emotional intelligence, throughout the entirety of our life, I wanted to take a different approach to emotional intelligence and look at how, how we can prepare and arm ourselves as both CMAs, as both management accountants, both in our professional and business life and also our personal life as well. But just listening to Deepal's uh, presentation as well, I'm just blown away by the amount of resources that he has available to you. So really looking forward to reading his material. But one of the things that he 
said that I would carry after, uh, carry after this session is the most interesting book you will read is yourself, and that itself sets the tone for the session. So fl flowing through from him, I'd like to take on a different approach to emotional intelligence, just because you've heard of, you know, the stock standard emotional intelligence that we invest in, which is agility, communication, resilience, so on and so forth. I just want to take on a different approach, given COVID itself has upset what it means to work, what it means to approach our families, and so therefore, how do we have those skills to prepare ourselves for the future, for during COVID and also post-COVID period. Yep. So I'm just quickly sharing my slide as well. There's just one slide and I'll run you through that and, and I'll speak to that slide uh, as we go along in the session. Um, and that's, that's, that's that. So what, what's interesting that I feel like during the, when, during the pandemic is the pandemic is a once in a hundred year um, scenario. So we've heard of recessions that happen every seven and a half years, the Great Depression every 90 years, and a pandemic is about a hundred years, which means our generation is perhaps the first generation that has had to go through this for a long period of time. And we are equipping our, ourselves, our family and our children for challenges of the future as well. And so how we approach business is dependent uh, dependent heavily on how we approach the world and how we view things. And so the first thing I, I feel like we need to arm ourselves as accountants is uh, something called emotional dexterity and agility. And what that means is that ability to fit into different uh, different models, different, different uh, objects. And so therefore give yourself the ability to stretch and morph into what is required of yourself during a pandemic. And this is important because when, when you're going through a pandemic or when you're going through a business crisis, you don't know where you're going to land. You know, there's so many moving pieces all together. And the only thing that you can do is hold your ground, stay true to what you do, who you are, your strengths, and speaking and following through from what Deepa mentioned, being mindful of, what it means to be you, your, 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 your sense of being, to be able to then land in the different aspects in which, uh, in which the pandemic is gonna land. It's a bit like, think like it's an earthquake. When there's an earthquake, your building is shaking and so therefore you don't know where it's gonna fall. So therefore, what can you do? You plan for different scenarios. And so you, effectively emotional dexterity means what us accountants do in the business world, which is what if analysis, scenario planning. So that's how you approach both work and, and your family as well. So COVID is happening. You're thinking, my God, my daughter has her A-levels. My, my son has her, his grade five scholarship. How am I going to do all of this? Is pandemic going to ruin everything? Take a step back, calm yourself, and just prepare for all the necessary options or outcomes that will most likely occur. You'll most likely land here or there or somewhere, but the best thing that we can do now is plan because the scenarios that we have that we can control within our means. And so therefore, when we extend ourselves, we, we augment, we, we, we morph into the different things that is required of us. And that's emotional dexterity and agility, yep. So in the workplace, how you would approach work is do what if analysis is across different scenarios so that you know you're gonna land somewhere. In your personal life as an accountant, what do you do? You plan for the different personal circumstances so that when you land, you land somewhere in a scenario that you have already perhaps planned for off of the strength and the calmness that you have brought to your table. Yep, so that's the first one. The second one is emotional resilience. We've heard of this time and time again. And effectively it means, I mean, simply when something goes wrong, keep a level head, calm yourself, relax, and just feel like what I want you to do is when something's going wrong and you've, 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 you've almost immediately hit into that fight and flight mode. And the fight and flight mode, most of you probably know that when you are faced with a crisis or a trauma or what we call a trigger event, almost immediately we go back to that caveman survival me 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 uh, mechanism of either we either uh, fight, so we go towards the problem and acknowledge it and tackle it head on, sometimes irrationally as well, because we're running on adrenaline and you know all of those uh, hormones that drive that protection that we have, uh, we have evolved with, or we go into the uh, flight mode, which is run away from the problem, sometimes burying our head in the sand like the ostrich does, and then we don't uh, deal with the problem head on. So the whole idea about emotional resilience is, firstly, I feel like bury your feet firmly in the sand. And I say that not in a literal sense, but take a minute to take stock of your, your surroundings and then say, look, whatever is happening outside, I'm going to sit firmly and I'm going to take one step 
at a time. Be level-headed about the way you approach things and take one step at a time, thereby buying yourself time to figure things out. Remember the first one, we were talking about dexterity, where it's about different scenario planning, figuring out where you're going to land so you know you're going to land somewhere you've already done the work for. With resilience, it's about taking one step at a time, little by little, but keeping a level head. Um, I'm reminded of a quote that somebody once said, I think it was Gandhi, but I'm not sure, so don't quote me on it, where um, you, 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 it's interesting to approach life like you open a window and you see all these crazy thoughts, crazy crises passing by your window and you look out to the window and then you pick and choose what crises or what topics or what uh, confrontations you wish to acknowledge or allow yourself to be influenced by. So it's a bit like that. So with emotional resilience, COVID's running, uh, you know, grade five scholarship, grocery shopping, the shortages of food and, and uh, you know, your banking apps are crashing. Everything's going crazy outside the window. Push it outside the window. You sit in your room, drink a cup of tea, and then pick the little fights that you wish to take to then tackle at a given time. So what you're doing is you're pacing yourself to allow yourself the ability to structure which battles you're going to win progressively, thereby once building on the strengths and the calmness that you have within yourself. So that's your personal life. How would you approach it in a business as a management accountant? The same philosophy. When there's so many crises happening, and for example, in Sri Lanka, there's a forex crisis happening, there's a oil crisis happening, crisis, crisis, crisis. That's all we seem to be talking about. Sit back in your room, have a cup of tea. This is a proverbial or even a literal, quite literally have a cup of tea and then pick the little battles that you can take and then use an emotional dexterity to scenario plan your way out towards the crisis. Now you must be thinking these are business solutions. These are not emotional intelligence solutions. Emotional intelligence is that. It's about building, arming yourself, equipping yourself with the right coping mechanisms to drive uh, calmness to find solutions towards the larger problem or conundrum that you have. It's about building, uh, it's a bit like wearing, you know, suit and tie your armor, a, a shield, a sword. That's what emotional intelligence is for you. The last one is communication of imperatives. And this is interesting, communication of imperatives. And I love this because I was having a discussion with, with my husband as well about this is, you know how emotional dexterity was different scenarios, different scenarios. Emotional resilience is about, I'm going to do this my way, one step at a time. Communication of imperatives is focus on what is important at the time. So remember the window where everything is running, 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 and you're, you're just such a fluster of issues in your life. Focus on the one thing that is critical at the time. Not just one thing, but the, the most important thing. So yes, there is a forex crisis happening. Yes, there is a uh, oil crisis happening, blah, 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 blah. Is it important to you at the time right now? If it is not important, don't worry about it. Just focus on predominantly what is important to you at a critical moment or junction in your time and then have to focus on that only. Be able to be laser focused on removing the noise out of your mind and space through a deep outset mindfulness. That is why I just I was I was amazed by what he just mentioned before, is that separation of the noise in your mind to focus on what's fundamentally important to yourself. It's, it's significantly hard to figure out what that is, but it is about removing all of the, the naysayers, the noise makers, the, the, the noise outside the window, and then focus on what is fundamentally important in front of you to give you a uh, laser focused ability to focus on the solutions to what is important. And then once you do that, you're then able to get quick wins to then move on to the next thing. And what's interesting about quick wins is we always say this, right? Whenever there's a crisis or conundrum, oh, do the small things, do the little things so you progressively win little things. So eventually you look back and you're like, oh, you've done so many things. What we're trying to actually subconsciously do is as, as human beings, because of the way we approach, uh, the way we work, because of positive psychology, what happens is when you do some when you do something good when you do something and you build winnings or strengths it's based on strength based uh, uh, psychology where you go from strength to strength and so that way it builds your confidence to tackle some of the other issues so to draw it back into the covid example things are going outside your window so many crises keep a level head right so emotional resilience you plan for different scenarios but you focus on the one important critical aspect at the time the most important problem to you and then once you solve that tick 
it gives you confidence to then go and challenge something else that you need to do. So little by little, what we're doing is we're segmenting the different triggers or the crises into manageable chunks that gives you the confidence to tackle the larger pieces. Now, why is social media so bad though for this? Because you're sitting on your phone, scrolling, 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 problem, problem, problem. Oh, somebody's saying this, somebody's saying that. And we're not even started talking about fake news and you know, the silos, the, uh, the algorithm feeding into the silos and in the way news gets funneled to you. What you're supposed to do first, throw your phone away. Yep. Focus on what is important to you. Is it a family crisis? Is, is your grandmother unwell? The fundamental problem that is critical to you at the time. And then once you get through that hurdle, then you focus on the larger pieces or perhaps the other problems part of your repertoire that you need to solve as well. Yep. So one step at a time, a level head scenario planning, but focusing on the critical aspect. This applies to business as well. So as a management accountant, you're going to work and then your boss is saying, oh, my gosh, we don't have money for salaries. Oh, my gosh, we don't have cash flow. Oh, my gosh, we don't have. What is the most critical moment at the time in a pandemic? Even in a pandemic, it wasn't. If you think about it back, remember how we survived as a country. I know in Australia, it was quite similar to Sri Lanka as well. We had toilet paper crisis. I know it's funny, but we had we didn't have toilet paper. But generally, we had varying stages of the crisis. So it wasn't the major crisis, but it was segmented problems right through the crisis. For Sri Lanka, for example, there was a grocery crisis. Uh, you know, a lot of the vendors, car gills, kills, uh, they, there wasn't a, a structure in place to get your groceries. And eventually, you know, a setup was created. Then the, the website kept crashing, remember? Uh, because it was such a new phenomenon. And then after that, once it got up and running, then it was about delivery. And now it's about all of the other crises that come from it. So as you can see, big problem, but small, small stages of the problem. So therefore it is about the, the, the communication of imperatives is focusing on that stage at the time. So if you have, uh, for example, an organization, do you worry about sup larger supply chain gaps in, in the future? No, just focus currently on your cash flow of how do you get the lorries delivering the goods that you already have currently? And then start staging your problems across what's critical at the time and then phasing out A, the problems and phasing out the solutions and then using dexterity to scenario plan based on that as well. And why am I telling you this? Because your management accountants, management accountants know everything. As accountants, we're built to look at all the pieces of the pie and build solutions accordingly by bringing everybody together. Yep, but one step at a time. The fourth one is political acumen. And this, uh, it's always interesting saying this to a Sri Lankan audience because we're always super connected. We always know somebody, we know people, and also we know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. But what's interesting is, um, what's interesting is the, the, the importance of political acumen, but I think also the, the diversity of political acumen is critical, even more so in the post-pandemic world. And I say this because sometimes you could see almost a shift in, in the power dynamic or power base. And ultimately it's not about picking winners. It's not about, oh, who's gonna be the president? Who's gonna be the CEO? Who's gonna be that? It doesn't matter. It's about a diversity of the people you get to know at several layers in an organization or in society so that you always have somebody to tap into if you need something done. That's the Sri Lankan way, yes. But what's interesting is also, if you tap into different people, it, um, um, you're able to leverage on what, in a self, in a self, uh, selfless way, diversity of ideas. So it's not you're getting to know people because oh my license is you know needs renewing. I'm going to call a machang. It's not about that. It's about the diversity of ideas that come in that create innovative ideas or solutions that you perhaps haven't seen previously. It's about spreading yourself as vastly as possible with a cross section of people that. You may not move it. Say like, oh, I don't move with that person. I don't move with that person. Get to know a diversity of people so that when it comes to problem solving, you're able to then find out different solutions. How is this important for emotional intelligence though? You must be thinking, this is not emotional intelligence. It is because it gives you coping mechanisms to deal with any problem at hand. Why? Because A, you have a super connection to solve the problem. B, you hear stories of how other people tackle it that you perhaps or your circuit perhaps wouldn't have tackled elsewhere. And you see that more so in extremely diverse countries, like talent magnet countries where, for example, uh, how we would approach something, we would be approaching within a silo, but say maybe 
Uh, for example, even the COVID pandemic, we were losing our heads saying, oh, we've never seen a pandemic before. But uh, in Africa, they've seen Ebola. In, in Southeast Asia, they've seen uh, SARS. Then in the Middle East, they've seen um, MERS. And so therefore it's shared learning together, we can overcome the pandemic. And so therefore, how does it affect our emotional intelligence? Less stress, because we know we can reach out to people to connect the dots and learn from them as well. Yeah, so in business, how do you learn? You expand your network outside of just your industry, but other industries as well, because you can get in multidisciplinary or industry experience, but also in your personal life, if you expand your horizon, you're then able to get, um, a, expert advice, B, somebody knows somebody knows somebody, the Sri Lankan way, obviously. But then thirdly, lastly, there are solutions already there that perhaps somebody knows or have done differently. And you're expanding your diversity of thinking, thereby um, arming yourself with an extra sword or an extra helmet in your emotional intelligence repertoire to be able to cope with any of the challenges that come your way. Um, the, the next one is called holistic de decision making with the bias for survival. So as a, as a management accountant, we're generally really good at this. Hopefully, we're generally really good at decision making from a holistic point of view. And this is why I love if people ask me, people always ask me, why did I start uh, accountancy? So I, I, I am an accountant. I, 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 uh, I'm a member of quite a lot of the established uh, the, the membership bodies like yourselves but one of the reasons why i took on accountancy is because it gives you a helicopter view a snapshot of a strategic interplay of the different mechanics or the components of business that make it successful so when you look at an organization you can then draw on this is the levers you're going to pull so for example hr is there finance is there procurement is there contracts supply chain let's pull out different levers to be able to make the, the right decision for business in a pandemic what then happens is, again, going back to the communication of imperatives, what's your core focus? If your core focus was about survival, what was, what's your bottleneck of survival at the time? Was it cash flow or was it a, a big debt that you had to renegotiate or was it a lease that you had to renegotiate? So you're looking at making holistic decisions, but with the bias for survival to survive that pandemic. But the problem is we're already two years into the pandemic we do need to at some point start for planning for the post pandemic period as well. What then happens is if you notice with this COVID pandemic, it was a W. So we hit COVID, we survived, we thought, yay, post COVID, let's start spending, let's start hiring. And then we hit uh, uh, um, the wave three or wave four, and then we're like, oh, we're in COVID, let's stop everything. Yes, it is a bias for survival, but you're not thinking dexterity here and not think you're the different options as well. So even though you're in the middle of a crisis and you're making holistic decisions and decisions considering all the different conundrums in business, but you also need to, in the, in the spirit of survival, survival also means post pandemic survival as well. It's, it's really interesting. I love to see, because I, I do a bit of consultancy as well. I'd love to see some of these companies after the pandemic, they got out of the pandemic and they're like, what? But now, oh my gosh, we don't have staff. We don't have anything just because everybody's building towards only the end of the pandemic and nothing thereafter. So in summary, whenever you build or make decisions, make decisions that is built for the survival of the organization and, and then some as well. And that means the continuity of your business as well. How does that reflect on your personal life as an accountant as well, your family? When you make decisions for your family as well, it's about the, the, the planning for decisions of uh, what's happening currently in your family, but also in the longer term as well. It's about the, the bias of survival for your family unit as well. And another thing that's interesting is connecting bias of survival with communication of imperatives. I'd almost ask you to think about who is the most important person in your family? Who is your family unit? Does it consist of you know, your, your, your children and yourself or your children and your parents or as a family unit, it's about strongly, fiercely advocating for your family and the interests of your family. And that's another way that you can protect yourself from an emotional intelligence point of view, where reduce the noise around your life, reduce the, reduce the drama, the negativity, the naysayers, and only focus on who is my family? Who are the people that matter the most? Who is the critical, the critical people? And then make decisions that are best holistic for them but for the survival of that precious family unit. And thereby you'd realize that a lot of the noise that 
affects your emotional intelligence or you know the negativity in your life will fade away because you found out to fiercely advocate for what is important in your life. The, the sixth one is a uh, hope bearer. And this is, this is interesting. This is also again, positive psychology where even in a crisis, find little moments, little, little nuggets of moments of, of beauty, of hope, of, of bliss. Even if it is the most hardest thing to find, seek it out, vehemently seek out the beauty in life. Because what we're trying to do is little moments like this, ignite little sparks in your brain, thereby helping arming you with the ability to cope with the longer term conundrums. And thereby little, little sparks create a bigger spark. Let me give you an example. So say for example, even in the war, with, you know, we didn't know when the next bomb was going on or whether something was going to happen. We, did, we were living in volatility. Sri Lanka has been through so much. This pandemic is nothing compared to what we've been through. And, and that itself gives us strength that we'll get through this. It's, it's, not, it's, 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 it's one of the things that we as a country will go on to do. But what's interesting is even in the war, we saw beautiful, we saw new trees growing. We saw families, we saw babies being born. We saw um, you know, skyscrapers being built. We saw trees, flowers, focus on those beautiful things. And that sparked uh, you know, all your hormones in your brain to say, you know what, that's beautiful, focus on that. And then use Deepal's advice around mindfulness and just focus on that one thing for a moment and describe in, in, in great articulation how beautiful that flower was, the petals, about how pretty and pink it was and how soft it felt in your hand. Describe the senses of what that thing feels like and then you would almost immediately take yourself away from a war zone or a COVID pandemic and focus on the beauty of it that then arms you to aid in the short term, it makes you happy. And over a long period of time, you will then switch your brain to start actively thinking and seeking out the positives, thereby not seeing the negatives. There's nothing wrong with seeing, being a realist, but in times of heightened negativity, by taking on a realistic positive frame would arm you with the ability to cope because pandemic is something that is going to be eventually going to get out of it. It's about a survival game. It's about surviving and staying true to your mental calmness to be able to drive that pandemic through. Yep. So that's hope bearing. That is focusing on the, the tiny nuggets of beauty and happiness and grace and dwelling in that, perpetuating it, permeating in that happiness to then build those nuggets of happiness that becomes and surrounds yourself with happiness that then is, it's kind of sneaky because what we're trying to do is stay in that bubble of happiness so that when the pandemic rides through your window and passes by, you will emerge out of your house. Remember the window you're drinking tea? You will emerge out of your house, survival uh, and happy and ready to take on the next challenges because you haven't been in that, you know, the worrisome state that has, forlorn you and as Deepa said given you post-traumatic stress disorder yep um the next one is be unafraid of the new normal and I think um COVID, and I, I don't want to sound like you know it's it, we've heard it so much but there is a new normal and you know things are going to stay and it is going to change it is going to slightly change some things are going to go back to normal. Some things are going to remain the same, but some things are going to find a hybrid. For example, you know, the relationship between worker and, work and employer and employee, return to work, so on and so forth. Some companies will say, we're going to do a blended. Some organizations are going to say, come back to work. So in, in, in essence, in summary, there is a new normal. And almost, it, it's a bit like this, like, you know, as, and I'm very conscious that as, as leaders, we always use these words and say, oh, new normal, everybody get with the program. What I want you to do is be calm, be, be, be like a leaf, fly in through the wind or like a stream, just go with the motions, but go at it in your own pace. Remember, use your emotional resilience, keep your feet on the ground, focus on the one core thing that matters to you, your family unit or the one thing that matters to you. Give yourself dexterity to land in the different scenarios, don't be afraid of this jargon. Don't be afraid of all these big, big people or big things or some president in some other country, the US or Australia saying something. Let everything happen. Everything, do whatever they want to do. And you just find your niche, your space. 
one step at a time in whatever lands. Yep, so do your scenario planning, but know that you cover your bases, but be comfortable in where you land and take it one step at a time. So don't be afraid of the new normal. Just let things settle down and then you'll be able to find where you fit in that large piece of the pipe. And then lastly, empathy and transparency. This is probably stock standard emotional intelligence, but one of the, one of the simplest things you can do in a pandemic is just empathize, just relax, just, just think about how it would feel like for somebody else going in your shoes. And I don't mean, I don't mean, um, Word for it, where they say comparing notes, like, oh, you don't have you, you, you know, you don't have uh, you know, your child is not going to school. Oh, I don't have I don't have bread for lunch. It's it's not a it's not a pain game, it's you're not comparing notes. What we're trying to say is just be patient with people. Don't judge, just let everything be. Just let everything be. If somebody doesn't have something and if you don't have something, it's not about who's who's not having the most or who's having better. It's not a comparison game. It's about being empathetic to if you don't have something, I think I know what you're feeling. Or if you are feeling that, I think I know how I would feel if I was going through those shoes. Just fundamentally during a pandemic, especially during a pandemic, because we're all at the same stage in different, different boards. Be patient with people, but more importantly, also lastly, be transparent with people as well. Be honest and transparent because it's all you can do. So in a pandemic, so many shifting pieces, so many power brokers changing, so many, the structures of what we consider society is changing. The fabric of society is changing. Remember things are like falling all over the place. What you can do is keep your feet on the ground, focus on the most important, plan for scenarios, Build on your political acumen, but lastly, just be patient with yourself. Be patient with the people around you and be open and transparent about how you're feeling at the time. So be have open dialogue with saying, ask for help, but also be transparent with each other about why you're taking decisions, why you're doing certain things, and ask for that patience. And this breaks out into two tracks. Number one, if you're a management accountant in an organization and you perhaps have to take some tough calls in organizations, be transparent about your decision making and be patient and empathetic to the people you're dealing with with bad news. With your family, be transparent with your family. Because the social fabric itself is changing, you can sit down with your kids and say, you know what, things are tough. And you know, I'm going through some tough times at work. Or, you know, your mother is going through some tough times at work, your archie is going through tough times at work. Uh, at home. And so be transparent, have open dialogue and break the fabric or the, the very things that restrain you, but fundamentally take it at your own pace. Let everything, if ever I leave anything uh, with you, let everything run outside your window, sit back inside your room, have a cup of tea and let all those emotions run right, all the crises and pick and choose at your own time what you want to tackle but that is most important to your core family. And that's ultimately what emotional intelligence is. I'm happy to take questions after, but I know that you know we have an incredible panel uh, here today. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for the thought provoking presentation as to the use of emotional intelligence skills to resolve the negative sentiments associated with the pandemic. So now the time to listen to Hasita's presentation. Asita will be speaking to you about the CFO's response to COVID-19 pandemic and aftermath. Over to you, Hasita. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor, for uh, organizing this event at a very important uh, time, both from a country perspective as well as from the global economy perspective. I think uh, it's a time that uh, the, the community needs to get together to see how uh, we need to move uh, forward. Uh, whereas a lot of criticism, a lot of challenges, a lot of stress in the system. Uh, but it's, it's all about how you manage and take out the stress and take a st step back and uh, come out with it. So I would like to uh, uh, run through a few slides. Uh, I know that I can share the screen. Uh, yes. Yes, you can share. Uh, yeah, so I will uh, focus on my topic basically to look at uh, how CFO should respond in an environment of uh, COVID 
and beyond. Beyond is a very important word because we've been waiting to uh, go beyond for a long time, I think the last 18 months. Uh, many times we thought we, go, we went beyond, but we just got back with another variant. So it looks like uh, the beyond is a little bit of a word at the moment, but we will have to uh, take a step at a time, learn to live with this uh, uh, drama going around and uh, how to balance things off, which is why I thought that uh, uh, in my presentation, I'll touch first on the CFO's challenge, the key challenge, what's the one big question that a CFO will have in his mind if you're dealing with these type of situations, and then to take a measured response to counter the challenge. The three R's, revisit the basics, renew stakeholder expectations, and revive and beyond. How do you revive, go revival and beyond to manage? So first on the CFO's challenge, the single biggest question for, I think in a, in a CFO's mind is how to balance these two things. One is the health and safety of your people. Another thing is the profits of the organization. In another, I'm talking in a corporate language, but in a you know, in the country's language, the famous wording between economy versus health and safety of the people. So I think there is no doubt, no debate, nobody argues that health and safety is number one. That's the priority for all of us. Our people, our communities, our society, number one is the health and safety of everybody. So there is no compromise on that. There can't be any compromise on that for that matter. But in the meantime, the other side to the story comes with the, if it's a pro organization, it's, it's a business, it's a profit, it's if we need a not-for-profit organization, how do we keep your cash flows intact? If it's a government, how do you manage the economy? So broadly, as a CFO, you will have to be beat in the private sector, or beat in the state sector. You will have an important role to balance these two areas very consciously, keeping in mind that, of course, health and safety at this stage or any stage is number one. So in that context, I think when you look at the response, uh, first thing I would say is to look at the basics before you go into any complicated conversations uh, and look at how do you balance the two. Because one of the big things that you need to look at is you need to understand where you stand before you talk about any renewal of stakeholder expectations. Because everybody should understand that this is an unprecedented event and, and you can't achieve the profitability or the or the uh, top line growth or any other matter that probably would have achieved under normal circumstances. So the expectation setting becomes very crucial, but to get there, you need to first get to the basics. When I say basics, first thing about uh, the organization drive uh, from a business perspective for the CFO is the cash flow. Because if you don't have the cash, if your operating cash flows dry out, then you have a problem to survive and go beyond that. So that's where uh, most organizations uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic took some very interesting, important measures uh, to look at your accounts receivable uh, and look at whether your customers are still there right at the beginning. And once now we have come to now a point where stability has uh, uh, been uh, coming back gradually, right? And in the meantime, of course, the uh, the customers and 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 how we work with those customers and uh, tracking and and following up very closely of the developments in the customers world is important and same on the other side with the suppliers where you will need to negotiate your credit and uh, look at uh, transparency in the supply chain uh, so that you have uh, visibility between what's happening around the buyer's world and in the supplier's world. Because that's a very important thing, uh, especially in the industry, where I mean, in the export world, uh, where your buyer is uh, in, in the Western world or maybe far away from you, and your supply chain is on the other side of the world or maybe closer to your uh, doorstep. So naturally, uh, bringing the transparency between the two sides and ensuring that there is uh, connectivity is absolutely important. Then we talk about uh, inventory side, which is another big thing uh, in, in times of uncertainty, which we need to look at carefully how we need to manage our inventories because there is a tendency to um, obviously overstock to manage the crisis. We do that even today because you know the logistics crisis that's going on in the country, in the world. So much of uh, shipping lines are stuck. So many, uh, uh, the, the rates are almost uh, four to five times more than what it used to be. Uh, and more, more than that, the ships are not coming on time. There are so many bottlenecks. So to counter that, uh, we, we have no choice, but at least on the imported goods, we need to have a slightly higher inventory uh, that we need to maintain. So that, that uh, uh, brings us to a, a point where how do we manage our inventories, but of course, uh, with cash flows in mind. Then the CapEx side, 
uh, capital expenditure spending. Initially, it was more about freezing it, but now it's more about releasing the critical capexes, getting the priorities right, and focus on the new world of spend uh, rather than just spending how the pre-COVID environment uh, planned it out. So there has to be a very clear difference in your capital expenditure as well, because there will be certain areas where you would want to put the money uh, looking at future trends and future permanent changes that we are seeing due to uh, COVID-related uh, developments. Uh, your bank debt, your cash flows need to be looked at, revisited in terms of how it needs to be restructured because in, in, at times of these uncertainties, it's important uh, not just to talk, wait, wait for the government to come and offer you a debt moratorium, but also for yourselves to speak to the banks, make it transparent and have a win-win situation between uh, uh, both sides. The second one is on the overhead side, while uh, profitability becomes important, I think, as I said before, we need to set the right level of expectations and, and overhead, which is in, in your control, is something that you need to carefully look at and, and plan for worst case uh, scenarios and, and obviously look at uh, uh, what kind of uh, liquidity stress is there in the system. That is, when you talk about liquidity, how much cash you have to meet your expenses. So your expenses need to be tuned according to that. And obviously, if there are revenue shortfalls, you need to clearly look at how you need to bring down your expenses uh, to meet. Otherwise, the organization will spend on your reserves. Uh, and if you keep doing that for too long, there might be bigger challenges in your head. And also, uh, saving opportunities and uh, look at what other specific areas you need to focus on. Today, the working from home has become now uh, more of a habit. Uh, and then we are joining in from home and uh, having board meetings or any other customer meetings, supplier meetings, bank meetings, all kinds of meetings which we used to run run out there. So how do you make that a, maybe a permanent thing, make it a policy, maybe maybe make it uh, uh, as a continuation, which also not just help the people's convenience, but also it helps to get, uh, get, get the cost savings as well. So as a CFO, you will have to look at how you can look at some of these permanent changes that are happening after COVID uh, to help you in managing your cost better. Then when it comes to the balance sheet, obviously, as I said, the debt restructuring is an important thing because you need to have uh, good communication with your banks and look at uh, reasonable gearing targets because the key, key argument is if your balance sheet has uh, some strength, this probably is the time where you will have to turn that uh, asset strength into more cash for cash. That's where you, you might borrow a little bit more, hold on to cash, little extra, and also uh, look at asset protection because overnight your assets, uh, certain parts of your assets can go into impairment. So you will have to look at uh, that very carefully and ensure that your balance sheet uh, is looked at regularly in the context of the new developments that are taking place, especially the way the currencies have moved at times, interest rates have moved at times. Uh, it can hit your balance sheet uh, strength. So it's something that you need to keep a close eye to see how uh, the balance sheet uh, asset and the liability base uh, comes together. And another important uh, thing in times of crisis, especially when we went in April 2020 to uh, the lockdown uh, almost 18 months ago now, uh, and time to time we've been going back to lockdowns and getting into these working from in, uh, home environments, uh, it's important that you understand that your information data um, and you're signing digitally you're doing so many things digitally but you may not have taken the adequate precautionary measures to counter some of those risks that are associated with this digital world so uh, but in that context uh, there, there, there can be there can be uh, more more uh, room for fraud right people to take uh, uh, money out of the system or uh, it can be digital fraud it can be any other forms so uh, it's important to understand that when people are going through tough times there can be human uh, be, human beings sometimes turning in different forms so you need to tighten your controls and have different methodologies of uh, uh, identifying uh, the information movements and other decision making related uh, uh, criteria as well as uh, fraud management which is uh, which is very important because there can be such situations coming out in these difficult times especially because we were forced to go there and and uh, work from home go digital uh, maybe faster than what we thought we all wanted to go into this digital transformation into the digital world but we were pushed into it 
uh, faster than uh, all of us thought. So, so naturally, we were caught on the wrong foot at times, but then we adopted to it. But now, after 18 months, you should be in a position or you should be working very closely to assess the risks associated with that and how to mitigate those risks. So don't forget that, because that I consider now as a basic, because the basic controls have to be in place for you to step up. So with that, uh, the second thing on the response should be about managing the stakeholder expectations. Now this is very important from a CFO point of view, because as a CFO, you should see uh, what is going on in the organization on one side, and on the other side, what is your uh, shareholders expectation as well as the other stakeholder expectations are. Because profitability targets, you may have, let's say, pre-COVID had an 8-9% target, but can you now uh, bring down that target? Because sometimes if you keep pushing for that 10% and say, hey, we did pre-COVID 10%, I don't care about COVID, I want 10% irrespective of whatever happens. What you do is you bring unnecessary stress into the system. There's nothing called we do it somehow, we'll somehow achieve 10%. There's nothing called somehow, you need to have a plan to achieve whatever you're trying to do, right? And there can't be, you know, the God won't come tomorrow morning and say, hey, here is your 8% margin now and uh, take it. That won't happen, right? Naturally, you will have to make it happen by putting unrealistic, undue pressure into the system. Sometimes you might kill the system. You might destroy the system. You might destroy the people with too much stress into the system. And when they can't have the people tend to give up and obviously the motivation goes down and that totally goes into a reverse spiral. I think the previous speakers also alluded to that. You need to have the empathy at the end of the day as a CFO and look at what is the expected, what is really delivered. It's not to say you'll be relaxed and just do whatever you want to do, no, but it's about finding the right balance. And once you figure that out, you need to go back to your banks, to your, to your shareholders, to your other stakeholders in concern and set the expectations right and say that look guys this is the reality right and this is unprecedented event and this is what we have done so far and probably we are looking at a reduced margin at this stage and we will work with this but we are working to improve we are working to improve and these are the measures that we will take Today, it's very uncertain whether we will uh, be able to fully run the operation maybe in three months, in the next three months. But if it improves, this is what we will deliver. If it doesn't improve and maybe get worse, and if we have a fifth wave one for, for some reason, right, then this is what we are going to do. This is what we are going to achieve. So, so that target setting probably may have to be done in scenarios and looked at in a way that everybody understands and we be very transparent and open about it. Because my, my biggest challenge in the last maybe 18 months was also to ensure that everybody understood that uh, there is something to profit, but also there is more what is something more important called the health and safety of the organization. So how do you strike that balance and not to over push, over kill it, and in the meantime, manage that. So it's very important to set that target in a proper way. And from a risk perspective, financial risk perspective, one of the biggest things that you need to also look at is some of these macro shocks that are going through because you saw the forex uh, related movements in the last uh, maybe 18 months we've seen uh, pressure on the currency pressure on the interest rate banking system itself is under a lot of stress because uh, uh, there are so many moratoriums etc that hold back debt repayments so we need to understand those risks and set the new expectations and say if it's going to be a, a depreciating currency it is going to be depreciating currency that's what it is so how do we face that reality new reality and again, how do we mitigate that risk? And on the other side, take a closer look at your long range planning and uh, don't stop the planning because planning at the end of the day is very important uh, because if you don't have a plan, you don't know whether you achieve something or not. That's the most important thing about having a plan, right? You plan, you, you plan and you might achieve something completely different, but still at least you know that you achieve something different because you had a plan. So it's important to have the plan. Don't lose faith in a plan. Uh, and, and drop the idea and say, now no point in just planning because you can't plan uh, tomorrow can be something different, right? It will be, always it will be, and that's the world we've been living for last so many years. Uh, but let us, let us hold on to that. So setting right expectations is very important as a CFO. I think that stands uh, uh, to stay very close to your CEO and hold hands together and ensure that there is a win-win for everybody in this expectation setting. So I think 
while you while you set the expectations and you you, you play as a CFO very unbiased role in doing that, it's also important uh, that you start looking at beyond COVID and see when and where it happens, right? Or it will gradually happen. How do we respond as an organization or as an economy to take things forward? So revival has to be uh, thought through and then how do we take it beyond that is the next thing. So first thing is about the financial projections, profitability and 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 uh, obviously when you talk about the budgeting process, I think you can't probably have a budgeting process that is similar to what you had pre-COVID because it's time to relook at the budget and because it can just be going in circles if you just uh, fix one number and move forward. So the key to critical part here would be to look at uh, communicating with your uh, internal organization, first of all, from top to bottom, starting from the st uh, your stakeholders, your, your, your investors or shareholders, and then uh, from uh, uh, the senior management right down to the organization about possible financial targets and preferably more cash centric. Uh, financial targets compared to pre-COVID uh, and uh, uh, make those financial targets realistic. They, don't, they should not be like what I said before, unrealistic targets. And then you need to start uh, looking at not just the financial targets, but also some of the key metrics based on what's going on out there. For example, in the parallel industry, not only a parallel, in many industries today, your digital sales, your online sales are significantly increasing. So that means there is a channel shift. The, the people who shopped in a shop is now shopping at home on, through your online channel. So how much are we moving? Have we pushed X percent, say 30% of our sales into online or 40% of sales of the online? Can that become a permanent thing? Have we got our systems right, processes right to support it? So these are things that you need to look at and ask the right questions and, and also adopt the new marketing strategies to uh, support these trends and ensure that you don't lose as an organization in this changing uh, economic dynamics. And also, uh, always look at the capacities, whether you're in a production environment or in a service environment, your capacity is shrunk with COVID because you can't do uh, the same level of work at the workplace uh, in a factory environment. We had to cut down so much of capacity because of social distancing requirements. But uh, gradually, when things improve, uh, this capacity will again, again, bounce, again bounce back. Now, don't forget that when the capacity bounces back suddenly, it's not only your capacity that's going to come back. Or in other words, the whole world will see a supply side increase overnight, right? Overnight or gradually. I don't know that too, too early to say, right? Whenever it's going beyond, right, it might see a gradual increase. So when that supply supply side increases, and if the demand has already moved up, right? Today we are seeing a bit of a situation where the demand is more than the supply in most cases. So prices are going up all over the world, be it commodities, petroleum. Uh, uh, even apparel for that matter, uh, cotton prices, everything is uh, just going up, gas to uh, rice to everything is going up because there is a supply side constraint because of COVID. You can't make everything at the same pace you did, but the demand picked up uh, much faster than most of us thought thanks to some of these vaccination drives right across the world, right? which is a great thing, right? But supply still takes time. But when supply starts picking up, don't forget that the demand and supply equilibrium uh, uh, that is a little bit of a, a mismatch at the moment will we'll start coming back together and that point suddenly from right now where you're in more of a suppliers market you might end up in a buyers market where in a buyers market naturally your prices can come down you might not have the orders suddenly in your factories or, or, or in your service organization there will be more stiff competition that will come in so prepare for that i mean you need to see what are you going to do differently post covid to ensure that there is a uh, readiness in the organization to fight back uh, in the new world that's going to emerge. Uh, financial risk perspective, I don't want to take, uh, take too much time. I'm sure previous speakers also did speak about this aspect. We are dealing in an extremely volatile world uh, where, as I said, our, our uh, accounts receivables were under a lot of pressure. Uh, interest rates and the forex side and also uh, the insurance uh, insurable risk you need to really relook really at your insurance policies and see whether they cover the risks that are emerging in the new world so think about those aspects uh, carefully and also uh, from a from a forex uh, and interest markets perspective
this is something that is uh, driven by a very much an artificial environment or a covid pandemic environment and like like i said before when things move out of the pand pandemic situation gradually there will be a very different set of demand and supply equations even in the uh, financial markets so that comes in your interest rates might look very different your exchange might look very today the inter inter exchange rate is under a lot of pressure and you are seeing a single digit interest rate right sometimes you might see that your interest rates will go up and your uh, your your uh, currencies might uh, stabilize uh, much faster so so i think it's it's important to understand that these shifts can happen gradually and you're ready for it and you're preparing the scenarios to adopt in such environments and then like what i said before the wrong long range planning side is very important so so talk about this new normal brainstorm it right look at bring ideas bring expert views right and look at the resource allocation for this transformation in your organization post covid one advice from me is don't go back to pre covid don't go back to pre covid because we've had a lot of good things we've learned during this 18 months uh, and it has been forced into us uh, because uh, if it has not been forced in we would have done not done a lot of things uh, uh, kicking the can because they are normally as human beings uh, resisting change right but with the change being forced on you because of covid i think some of the positives that came out of it like you know uh, working from home environment example we are find the right balance you can't have 100% working from environment but you don't necessarily need to go back 100% to uh, Uh, the pre-COVID environment, you can have that right balance, two to three days of the week, or certain specific meetings, and look at how you can better allocate your resources and benefit out of those environments, so that you don't lose the people touch, you don't lose the uh, importance of having face-to-face -face meetings, face-to-face -face seminars, etc. Right? But I'm sure that we will learn how to do more webinars and a few seminars as well. So, so the, the, this type of engagement that we are having today can have a good balance going forward, so that we will uh, uh, really be, the, be, be learn and and take what the learnings of the COVID times to the future. Then, of course, the digitization drive. This is something that every organization should not uh, just do it during the COVID time. You have to look at this as a medium to long term strategy. Invest the money is there, uh, be it for digital marketing, be it for digital sales, e-commerce, right? Be it for uh, manufacturing environment, be it to manage your people in the organization with the working from uh, from home cultures, be it audits, right? Where they are, I know that uh, some of the audits in the last couple of years, the the stock uh, takes were taken online. Our stock takes were taken online, uh, which uh, I don't think uh, even the auditors or us ever dreamt of even uh, that kind of environment. environment where you take the video uh, camera uh, and you uh, walk through on the factory floor while the others watch from out there and uh, look at the count so 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 this type of creativity came out and we went digital but don't go back completely right and find that right balance and digitization is something you need to consciously invest into and more than that do that change management don't just uh, think that covid just forced it in and we all learned and we adopted it no right human beings are human beings after all we don't like change i know a lot of people are waiting back to go back to the old days right but don't unless you are consciously managing that change looking at the pros and cons the benefits etc and uh, uh, the driving that together in a more scientific way then then you will not achieve medium to long term success in your digitization right and also it's important to keep the compliance right keep the compliance side going because this type of unprecedented time sometimes force you to think that okay central bank will forget bui will forget customs will forget inland revenue is not working so let's not worry about paying taxes right so now that's 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 wrong attitude wrong approach because everybody is in trouble we need to feel for all of them and we need to hold hands together and and work in these environments in a transparent manner because obviously it's important it's very very important in my opinion Uh, that we consciously look at the implications of compliance and ensure that there's no compliance is met because right through the uh, journey uh, we need to do that and of course uh, we need to have the right level of communication with these uh, stakeholders uh, who are integral part of our organizations and our society when you talk about see a post world i'm talking about so finally to conclude right so first as i said before in the revival and beyond look at reinventing your workplace 
uh, certain areas of financial policies, be it the method of decision making, opportunities for mergers and acquisitions, um, and also uh, look at uh, how you can drive uh, profitability in, in different forms and by, by looking at uh, opportunities to increase your uh, liquidity of assets, etc. Right. Secondly, digitization, as I said, it's very important to have a structured approach to digitization, not just an ad hoc, uh, forceful uh, uh, COVID-led digitization. It has to be also more structured and brought together. And uh, in, in terms of the governance, I think it's also important to have these two sets of teams, right? One set of team who will be the crisis team, who will deal with the fire and the fires will be there every day right you will have a covid uh, uh, positive you will have first contacts you will have quarantine you will have to manage the hotels you you will have to do things that you never did before right so you need to have those crisis teams on one side many uh, fires but on the other side everybody should not be in the fire because if you run uh, the fire then you will forget the future right so there is has to be that certainty you need to have thinking about the future planning and some of the things i said before to ensure that there is a clear focus and mind time of people because it's very easy today to drag on to the crisis and just go crazy with the crisis and spend all your time in the crisis and if everybody do that that means your organization will not probably get out of the beyond right so that's very important to go beyond so to conclude my uh, presentation i hope uh, I gave a message on the balance aspect of it because this is uh, an unprecedented pandemic that we are going through. Health and safety is number one above all, right? And in the meantime, as CA post, you will have to also look at how do we bring the uh, profitability angle or the economics into play and uh, how do you set better expectations and, and look at fresh targets to ensure that you set the right expectations and also look at how the how to take the stress out of the system by setting those expectations to ensure that you don't destroy the system processes people in the organization and by by putting too much stress at a difficult time and in the meantime of course be ready for the takeoff because don't forget that there is a future and there'll be uh, an end date to this crisis we will come out of it and when we come out of it we need to be standing strong even stronger than before COVID time. So thank you very much uh, uh, for the time given, and I hope uh, this helped to get a bit of understanding of uh, how we need to structure ourselves and, and progress. Uh, so all the very best to uh, everybody, and I'm sure uh, that uh, you will uh, come out stronger, as I said before, and, and, and have the crisis managed on one side, while on the other side, have the teams thinking how the future will look like and remodeling yourself to face the beyond. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hasita, for the excellent presentation as to the challenges faced by organizations and CFO and how to respond to that challenge. So I like very much your phrase, don't go back to the pre-COVID period. So I think we can excellent, now we can really match. You, you emphasize the importance of balancing Deepal and Mariam spoke about mindfulness and emotional intelligence. So even though we have three presentations, there are many interrelated ideas. So now we will invite the panelists to, sorry, the audience to come up with their questions. Meantime, until they are ready with their questions, Mr. Yes. Jayasekar can share his thoughts about yes. the presentations. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Samanti and uh, all my uh, three speakers. You all have done a very good job today. And we have come to the last session of the CMA Sri Lanka uh, National Conference. Now, uh, I would like to ask the first question from my old friend, uh, Deepal. Now, uh, I think uh, uh, today's uh, all three presentations, we were talking about uh, ourselves and uh, the our business how to safeguard the business now you are talking about mindfulness i think uh, to think about yourself first now once uh, lord buddha had said naparesam vilomani naparesam kata kata atta nova avikkeya katani akatani ke the lord buddha mentioned that concentrate what you do what you talk rather than 
the people who others talk and what others do. How can we relate that to mindfulness? We have to unmute uh, Deepa. Uh, please unmute. Yeah. yeah, even virtually, it's nice to uh, be with you. Uh, yes, it's a very interesting question. Right, uh, this links to the point uh, I think uh, even Marianne uh, uh, discussed. Now, we tend to spend a lot of time on others, right? Because naturally we are programmed, our eyes are to see outside, our ears are to hear from outside. You know, everything is focused outside. So we have to take an effort to uh, focus inside. And uh, I would like to link what you said, right? Uh, when you start worrying too much about what others have done, not done, and uh, you get confused and you lose focus. I think Miriam's presentation was very much on focus on what is here right now. Now, mindfulness is like a, how do you call it? Uh, it's like, uh, uh, it's like your trial balance. You know, it will tell where it is gone. <laughs> right from the center right whether it is in the wrong account right whether it is in the past account or whether it is in the future account and if it is not there you know you are not at the center so when you develop this ability to become aware of present moment what's happening which is the only real thing right past is a memory future hasn't come right and as you said it's okay to have a plan yeah you must have plans otherwise uh, you don't know whether you have come where you wanted to go but Constantly see, right? And actually, in this current scenario, what has happened is what normally happens happens a little fast, right? Normally, people get sick. Now we get sick much faster. Normally, people die, right? Even now, more people have died out of heart attacks and cancer than on uh, than due to uh, COVID even last year, right? So, but we see the more occurrence of COVID, right? And the folk, and, 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 and there's another important lesson. What you focus, get big, right? Today, everything is around COVID, but while this COVID is happening, right? People are trying to get married. Those who can't get married officially, uh, you know, they function, they just uh, start life, right? Although the doctors say people have children, life continues. This happened even during the war, right? But only thing is a little bit of a, you know, uh, like a workshop, huh? everything is happening, a bit real. So I think there's nothing new that is happening, right? And if you can focus on what is happening and to do that focusing, mindfulness, this ability to let go of what is not relevant, that comes in handy, right? All of us know what uh, Maryam uh, said, yeah, yeah, we need to focus on the current problem. We don't have to worry about everything, look for beautiful things. But then what happens to us, our mind goes away and into this uh, directing of movies. The moment you realize, ah, one of my movies that I'm directing, you can come back and let go. I think that's a good question to uh, link. And that's how I think uh, you can link mindfulness to present. Thanks for that question, Thank Jesse. Thank you, Deepal. Even uh, Mariam also, I would like to ask a small question. Now, Mariam, now under this COVID situation, uh, school children were at home. People were working from home. That means uh, in the, even the meetings, we were attending from home, even for this conference as well. Now, after this COVID situation, one day people will have to come back to office, we'll say. Now, when we talk about uh, your topic, emotional intelligence, now, people, even after coming to office, will they attend teamwork? Because now, even the school children come to school, they will not like to associate with others. They will have to be alone. Now, the workers also will not move with the others. So, how can we encourage the teamwork by using the emotional intelligence techniques? That's actually a really great question. And I love that. I think um, it's an interesting one because I've seen this across the generations as well, where there's an assumption that 
um, because people are working at home, they perhaps would end up being antisocial when they come into the work. Um, but what usually happens is because human beings are driven to want what they don't have, what happens is they would actually come into work significantly more engaged and more anxious, more, more concerned about or more, more excited to participate in teamwork as well. So it's more that de the deprivation of human or social contacts would in, in would almost induce further need for them to want more social interaction as well. So that's going to be really interesting because there's going to be individuals, at, it, it'll be a hub. So off of COVID, a lot of people would want to come back to work and then you'd see people easing off saying, look, you know, I've done that now. I've met my colleagues and I want to go back to working from home. And so therefore that's the balance. Uh, that we probably have to uh, have to balance and going back to Hasita's comments around don't go back to a pre-COVID world, completely agree. Find that balance, but maintain that balance uh, in terms of your, your social engagement. But people will be excited to do teamwork. The only problem is catching them once that high, once they get off that high of uh, social interaction and then they're like, I'm bored now, I want to go back to uh, staying at home. So in terms of your question, in terms of how do you use emotional intelligence techniques to drive that engagement? Um, be honest and transparent with your team members about expectations. So, for example, if you create an environment at your workplace where they have a lot of respect and, and trust in when they come to work, they're respected for when they come to work and when they're at home, you don't tell them, oh, you're not working properly. Uh, you know, the clock watching or, you know, the culture of you have to come to work just because I want to see you. That comes from a place of mistrust. So having trust in your employee and saying you're at home, I trust you, you're at work, I trust you. And so therefore, at any level of space, there's always that open transparency and trust around that space. That is uh, one of the ways that you could engage them, but also having a lot of fun human resource engagement strategies. So a lot of you know, uh, activities at the workplace, a lot of social gatherings, a lot of teamwork induced uh, ways of working would induce them to keep uh, doing a lot of the teamwork as well. But it's just mainly about instilling trust and confidence in the individual to feel safe at work, regardless of where they are, and also feel trusted and respected in that space. Thank you, Mariam. Now, I would like to ask a question from our Hashita also. Now, Hashita, now uh, you advise the companies to dispose the inventories, but the, the buyers also must have money. So they are also facing problems. So in that case, how can we increase the cash flow by disposing the uh, inventory or reducing the inventory? Because the banks are not giving loans because we have come to they have come to the maximum level of uh, uh, loans and other things. So how can we overcome this difficulty? Yeah, so basically, I think the, the important thing here would be to understand, as I said, whether your balance sheet and your, your uh, uh, strength of uh, the focus in the balance sheet is good enough uh, to, to uh, demonstrate to the banks or your shareholders or the financiers uh, to, to understand, first of all, to have that credit period extension to be taken. That's a very important, as I touched before, to have that restructuring of your debt. And most of the time you will find that uh, if you be transparent, open about the problem and show a scenario of a revival, there's a good chance that your finances will listen to you and give you a, a better result or, or a better solution and partner in that solution. Because that's very important because a lot of people tend to take a view that, okay, now the government has to solve this. Or this is government's problem, right? If you're running a business, it's your problem. You will have to figure that out and you need to go back to the bank, uh, talk to them, explain to them the problem and tell them that uh, this is the challenge I'm going through and you're also going through. Because we all know that if you, uh, if I don't pay, you have a, a bad debt, right? In the bank. So no banker would like to have a bad debt either in, in, in a provision in their books either. So banks will also uh, understand and work with you closely. But problem with most cases is the denial. We don't accept that there is a problem. We have to put our egos aside and say, hey guys, we are in trouble. We have a problem in the world, right? We have a problem without saying that there is no problem and everything is under, under control and hunky dory when your uh, uh, backside is on fire, right? So that you can't do. So you have to go be humble, put your egos aside, explain the real problem in a transparent manner, 
chances are that 95% of the time your financier will agree. That's the second thing is, like you said, your customer is also going through the same problem. You understand that, right? So, so obviously, uh, in, in, in certain industries, depending on the situation, you will have to gradually uh, have a plan to uh, uh, take the stocks out, inventories out in a, in a program manner. Now, uh, for example, I'll tell you from our industry, in April 2020, when the shop shut down with the Western world, we didn't have any sale. Our order book went to zero in a minute. Overnight, when we woke up, it was zero, right? But we went back to our customers. We said, we are not in a rush to ship anything. We also in the same situation, but let's talk. And when things improve, actually, we they get, agreed to buy but the good news is that they agreed to buy almost everything but not in three months or not in a two months but it extended as much as sometimes 12 months right now if your financiers have supported you you can hold that stock and partner with your customers problem and as a supply chain you can work together and solve the problem without you trying to just flush out your inventory to your customer and pass the problem to him Right, you will understand his problem, give him the time, but of course, for that, it has to work in a network. That network is what I was explaining before. Uh, only way you can get to that network going is to be credible. Your credible credibility will matter, and to be credible, you need to be honest, you need to put your egos aside, you need to say that there is a problem, and you need to talk in the open book and ensure that everybody understands the problem and we work through the problem and that way i think you're not passing the ball to anybody but you're actually uh, solving the problem as a team and this is why a lot of people say that extended supply chains have to get together in these type of environments to resolve you would have heard the word as headlines but this is a classic example because if the supply chain work together, not as a customer or a supplier or a financier or somebody else, but everybody get together as a network to resolve it, I think we can do that. Thank you. I Thank hope you. these bankers will adjust. Okay. Right. Uh, so there are questions. Don't, don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. <laughs> don't put your egos down and be humble and be transparent. I'm assuring you 95% problem will be solved. <laughs> Those are the four big things that before you start the match, you lose it. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So now we can take the questions from the audience. Asita, there is a question directed to you. There are, there are many companies which recorded historical high profits due to measured cost controls in 2021. How do you think this will affect the profit targets moving forward? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question because 2021, uh, uh, for that matter, even 21, 22 also, we have not yet uh, passed through that uh, period of abnormal times which are driven by uh, different uh, dynamics. So it will take some time for uh, this whole episode to settle down and, 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 and as the normal re comes in gradually, right? Uh, like what I explained before, there'll be a lot of ups and downs that we need to be ready for. And that is where it's important that you set the right expectations for at the time of the crisis and then beyond as well. So that you have a gradual pickup that you need to uh, take up. And in certain instances, in certain industries, you will see that the COVID has brought in extraordinary profits, which are not sustainable as well, right, in certain industries. In certain industries, there is no profit. I mean, they have to talk about in the PNL, it's a very ugly looking PNL, right, on the other side. So uh, those industries have to take their stock and look at how they need to gradually transform uh, this change with the external environment, because don't forget, as I said, the commodity bubble that is going on, in my opinion, it's a bubble, right? Because there is a high demand and supply has crashed. But that when it normalizes, you will see this starting to change and there'll be some big shocks, right? And some other industries that are celebrating profits today might uh, end up in the uh, crime mode, right? And vice versa. So, so uh, uh, it's important that to, to understand that change coming in and look at each variable that drives your profitability, be it cost. I think the question was about cost only, but I would say not only cost, but also your revenue drivers, your other cost drivers, and understand how each of those drivers will change in the next maybe 12 to 18 months as things progress gradually, right? And prepare for each variable to be uh, managed one by one uh, with some risk mitigation plans and scenarios. That's the best way to handle it. 
right thank you asita there is a question about the stressful job situation i think either deepal or mariam or both of you if you could address this question stressful job situation and tight work policies most of us are urged to do more faster with fewer resources so how to overcome this depression during this situation so the question is to deepal and mariam how to overcome this stressful job situations yeah, i'll first uh, give it a try and uh, probably mariam also can also add value to this I think it's a very real life question. Uh, this is exactly what I said. Let's break it into two. The problem or the challenge and our response to it. This is nothing new. Right? In life, there are many moments where uh, you have more to deliver than the resources you have. Ask any mother. She would tell that her entire life is this. And a lot of men don't understand what mothers go through, right? Whether COVID or not COVID, it is a classic case of delivering more with little resources. But if you get allow yourself to be sucked in by the challenge, then you will not have energy to think creatively and approach how you need to do it. So if you can learn to be mindful and stay away from it for a while, then you can take a look and say, okay, out of all these things, what is the number one, which is the most important one? And in order to do that, what is the smallest first step I need to do? Okay, let me take that. Right? When you break it into very small pieces, even the biggest problem is a small part of small problems, right? They say, you know, you can eat an elephant even little by little, right? So take that attitude. And a very important one is take the attitude that this too will change. This too shall pass, you know? Then you, you, you take a different attitude, right? Once the moment you change the attitude, which is the only thing in your control, right? Then you will start thinking of different ways, whether it is COVID or not. We in life, there's a lot, lot of opportunities for us to work and deliver results without not enough resources, right? So all what you need to do is change your mind and then create that space. And when you look from there, you will see different opportunities, right? Take your hand. If you bring it very close to your face, you can't see the hand, you can't see beyond. But if you put it away, then you can see the hand and see the uh, best of the area. So the trick is, can you take a perspective which is not getting sucked in by the situation? I think uh, Mariam uh, will also add some uh, points to this. Yes, Mariam. I love what you said, Deepal, and it's, it's just fascinating as well. I think I'm gonna rob a, rob a, a slide from your playbook as well around you said about when something goes wrong, first take a snapshot of yourself as well, pause. And I think fundamentally, whenever you are stressed as well, take a moment to build a toolkit of how you yourself respond to crises or triggers or you know conundrums in your life. And so therefore, when there is a trigger moment, you almost immediately then know how you as a person would react to, a, to an issue. So we all approach issues differently. Some of us are prone to problems. Some of us are really good at problem solving or crises. Some of us almost immediately, you know, hit, hit the accelerator button. So it's about work at yourself as well. I'm not saying you even do any work on it. Just figure out, take a step back or this is what you call the coolie glass method where you take, you, you take yourself outside of your own body, like an out of body experience and look at yourself in terms of how you're reacting to a situation. So therefore, you know how you would respond to a trigger. And then thereafter, use what the said around deconstructing what that trigger event is for to then be able to disrupt it with positive or, or productive thought process. And what the two of us are talking about is actually what we call cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, which is CBT, which is ABCD, which is an activity A. And the consequence is dependent on the B, which is the behavior. So whenever an activity or a trigger event happens, look at your uh, the, the belief system in which you approach it and then disrupt it with positive thinking or something that is uh, productive in the way you approach things. So firstly, 
know how you approach something. There's nothing wrong with how you approach something. It's just, you know, then immediately something has happened. Okay, I'm going to react like this. Pause, calm down, take a step back and start mitigating that. And then start thinking about how could you approach something productively and as he passed it, break it into manageable or consumable chunks and then deal with problem solving in the way you would deal with problem solving to disrupt it, to create positive newer consequences for the conundrum. Thank you, Mariam. I, there is a question to you, Asita, basically to me. There is a request to explain a little more on this asset protection and asset empowerment risk. Yeah, so I think that the protection side, uh, uh, first of all, if I touch, uh, the biggest uh, challenge that uh, one could go through is your both your fixed assets as well as current assets need to be looked at, right? First of all, on the fixed assets, uh, based on uh, operation or a factory, you tend to think uh, that you're just uh, taking out the taking out the cost out of it. But don't forget that you have an asset there, which probably will not be uh, put back to good use for some time because uh, obviously the deep supply side issues and other concerns might uh, keep the uh, demand down. So you might have certain assets uh, in the fixed asset side also going into environment risk. Similarly, on the current asset side, which is even more uh, important to look at, especially on the inventory front, uh, some of the inventories can get outdated when you have to hold on for a longer period of time. They can, delete, they can expire. Uh, so as a result of that, you will have to watch very carefully how you release your inventories uh, without uh, without without them being as fired uh, or impaired. So similarly, on the AR front, if you look at your accounts receivable as asset, Again, your buyers, your your customer might be bankrupt, right? Or he might be not in a position to pay you today. As a result of that, you might end up saying that you will have to uh, impair your risk. So that is where that you, without just taking a standard uh, approach of saying that, okay, it's impairing and it's over, you need to proactively look at those and take the measures we spoke about. I don't want to repeat what I said before, but some of those measures we, we, we have to take in order to counter uh, early enough right so that it won't get into the last stage where you're almost just going under the water and you're trying to survive but well before that if you take your take a proactive step then even the banks the earlier question corrected will uh, will have something to look at in your balance sheet otherwise if your balance sheet is gone dead right then naturally uh, there, 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 is, there is nothing much for the bank to do as well so that's why i keep using the word proactive be transparent uh, go out there and talk so those are the critical things that really can change these are soft things these are not technical management account in theories right these are simple basics that you need to follow uh, in, a, in a more of an organized structure so I, I i think that's the first uh, thing about this empowerment piece and then looking at uh, the the uh, insurance also is something that you need to really look at in this context because there are certain insurance policies that you can use and maybe the technical words that are there in your policies might uh, need to be looked at in a little more detail to ensure that they cover uh, your situation this pandemic situation and the resultant uh, areas right because a lot of the uh, insurance policies are made up for either fire or flood uh, to kick off your business interruptions right but not necessarily uh, a pandemic situation or, or even some of the not necessarily a covid but even some of the other measures that take place as a result of your accounts receivables going off so those areas uh, need to be looked at credit insurance and some of the other areas and you need to get some expert advice there because the insurers can be very smart in their terminologies and wordings and those small word conditions to 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 come back and say oops this doesn't qualify so that's why i said it's important that you look at it very consciously to, to reword and get your documentation right right thank you Asita. there's a comment also insurance is making huge profit under the pandemic so there's a comment but there's one important question i think was a whatever we can take up that question how to support teachers in emotional needs right now and how to evaluate the students' attitudes and emotions towards the sudden clutcher of the pandemic. So they are the two sides of the coin. So we can take the question together, uh, supporting the teacher's emotional needs and looking at that from the uh, children's point of view or the student's point of view. So both Deepal and Mariam are requested to answer this question. 
Well, it's a it's an area with a special speciality, but I will approach it from a, a common sense mindfulness uh, insight uh, point of view. I think if you start to care for each other, have some empathy, right? Uh, so if you can't love yourself first, then you can't care for somebody else. I think we are projecting our own dissatisfaction and frustration to the world. So I think what we need to do is begin to appreciate yourself, your family, and how fortunate you are, even whatever the condition you are. And a simple example, simple uh, uh, trick that I suggest is just ask yourself, if I were my own child, how would you look at myself? That will open out a lot of areas for you to be sensitive to yourself. Once you are a sensitive person to yourself, what comes out of you is also very sensitive, compassionate, and good. And with that, when you look at your teachers, right, I think you can do a lot of things, right? Now, how many of how many parents have sent a little thank you note to the teachers for what they have been doing, right? Uh, you cannot visit, but can you still go and you know, uh, deliver some things uh, to a teacher's home right? and uh, send a beautiful message to a teacher, right? Appreciate what they're doing. In Sri Lanka, these teachers are started online te teaching, uh, not by government uh, request, on their own, right? And now government is saying, please go and teach, but they, they decided to teach on their own, right? So appreciation, right? Same thing for children, right? Uh, recently I was uh, on a panel and they was asking the same question, right? You know, understand your child is now inside the house and he doesn't have time to go, you know, ability to go out. So don't think learning is, uh, you know, back to back, like our conference, you know, every half an hour to uh, go to a uh, Zoom class. No, right? Take them out of the house. Ask them to watch clouds, right? Not the TV screen. Ask them to watch clouds and start beginning to discover the world which is there. And ask them to see the plants in the garden and ask them to discover the different types of plants and the leaves and the little insects suddenly you will bring that sensitivity which Mariam uh, talked about out of love. I think we are completely forgetting the need for compassion, right? Whether it is at workplace, whether it is in this classroom or at home, I think there's a big opportunity for us to grow compassion and uh, loving kindness, you know, as human beings, these are essential human qualities. Once you bring that, I think things will come naturally because these are survival tools that are given to us. So we don't have to learn them. Maria, would you like to add something? Uh, I was actually waiting for a question to come to ask for your opinion, Professor Samanthi, as well. So would you like to take this question as well as an as a educator and a professor? Uh, how do you feel, um, you know, uh, for the support that, you know, the teachers need currently and also the, the support that students need as well? I'm just because I, I, I've, I've heard so much about you as well. I'm just keen to hear your take on it. Yeah, <laughs> actually, even in the universities, it is uh, rather the authorities have asked us to go for online teaching. That's true. But it is the own initiatives of the lecturers that had made it a reality. Uh, because there were a lot of issues initially because we were not very much used to online teaching. So always conventional type of teaching. So we had to, we had our own sessions where we got us trained. Then we learned from each other and started doing the session. So initially, even there were a lot of, uh, even we were a bit scared <laughs> to start work with online methods or more teams so that was there. But uh, after a few months, we gradually we got ourselves exposed to that. We started doing that. And actually, now it's really interesting. We are enjoying that. Right? Uh, so there, there were resource issues. There were 
resource uh, training related aspects were also there. Uh, and also uh, it was a change, rather it was a change. So initially even some of the lecturers resisted the change, but uh, gradually things changed. And even I believe that uh, students also initially had some uh, uncertainties. They shared their issues, problems with us. So we too had separate sessions with them to discuss the problems that they have in relation to online teaching and online assessments we do. So they came up with various issues. We listened to them and we also made some improvements uh, to respond to their change. And I also agree very much with Deepal. Learning is not what you do only in the classroom. So there are a lot of things that you have to do outside the classroom, whatever the level, whether you are a school child, whether you are at school or university, even at a higher level of your study at postgraduate, there are a lot of outside things that we have to do. And it is the responsibility of the teachers also to show the students that there are different means of learning. So what you say, this mindfulness, practices are essentially important for you to because it's sometimes the stress levels are high when you do teaching on online modes. Initially, the stress was quite high, but now we are quite used to that. Now it's part and partial of what we do. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yep, thank you. Shall we wind okay, up? Yes, yes Professor. Yes, I think uh, uh -huh. now we have come to the end of the session. Uh, so we had a very useful discussion today. So Deepa spoke about the importance of mindfulness and also he spoke about how the UK parliament had been benefited. And I, even I have read some articles about uh, Theresa May, how she was a former uh, UK prime minister was discussing the use of that in her office staff. So I think uh, Professor Vatavala and the team can make a suggestion the Sri Lankan parliament also <laughs> our parliamentarians to be trained in mindfulness techniques perhaps. Uh, so then came the Mariam's presentation, emotional intelligence, the skills of emotional intelligence, the importance of developing empathy and responding to the pandemic. And lastly, we listened to Hasita. So he brought up the uh, crux of the matter, the real problems, the real challenges that the finance of the chief financial officers are facing and how to respond to that. Though we were listening to three separate presentations, they're, they're, the those matters are quite interconnected. Then our co-chairman, uh, he with a very experienced person, uh, Mr. Jayasekar, with long years of experience in the corporate sector, as well as in education, he enriched the discussion with his useful insights. So thank you very much to all the speakers and also CMA for giving this opportunity to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Samanti. I think it was a very, very uh, excellent uh, session, a little different from what we earlier uh, would normally expect because we had uh, uh, the business side coming and then, of course, the uh, uh, mindfulness, which uh, really and the emotional intelligence, which should have given a, a new new thinking to our uh, management accountants and others who are listening to it. Because always we are thinking of the bottom line, or maybe a cost cutting, or these are the things we are thinking. But today, uh, we are very, very uh, happy that uh, this new uh, thought process was put into our mind. You know, we are, That's uh, something that I thought was very, very useful. Otherwise, we would have brought in maybe speakers on management accounting itself, but uh, we had an excellent speaker, uh, Hasita. I think he's gone through the whole thing. They are uh, one of the largest exporters in Sri Lanka, Brandix, I think. Uh, uh, so he was able to tell as to how they have uh, uh, met these challenges and done uh, extremely uh, well. You know? So let me uh, thank you, Professor Samanti, because I know that you, uh, uh, in your last comments, you really uh, told what you all have undergone, how you all really sacrificed uh, for the sake of the students and later where you all got uh, uh, used to the system, even the students uh, uh, were really thereafter uh, coming behind you all to get all these things which they would have normally not done. So we have to 
uh, achieve all these in a situation like the pandemic, you know, because even uh, for our own uh, professional bodies, CMA, we made a, a drastic change and uh, I'm sure uh, all our staff, our council members, I think Mr. Hennake is here, the vice president, uh, Mr. Jayasekar is there on the council, all the council members where they have all uh, got together and they've been supporting uh, this. And of course, I must say a special word uh, uh, to the uh, staff also, because uh, they've been really uh, doing extremely well. Our CEO, then of course, this conference itself, uh, where Shanti and others who have been helping many on the electronic side. Uh, yesterday we gave certain awards. I'm uh, sorry that uh, Mariam, uh, I don't know whether it was too late. I didn't see you, but certainly uh, we will send that to you. But we are going to have a, a later, maybe another presentation where you can come to Sri Lanka and then maybe receive it. So uh, I must thank uh, all of you all, you know, because you all really uh, devoted your valuable time, your and uh, thought uh, thinking process because I know Deepal is a very, very busy person and uh, how he has learned. Because he's really someone who's uh, uh, involved with the corporate sector and uh, one of the leading marketeers who has been uh, holding very high positions. And uh, uh, today, uh, this thought process of uh, mindfulness uh, has really uh, changed a lot of them, you know, where with a new thought process coming in, which I thought that our uh, accountants would also uh, find it uh, very useful. So uh, uh, today we've, uh, we've come to the end of it. Of course, our main theme of reviving the Sri Lankan economy, COVID-19 and beyond, uh, listening to all the uh, sessions that we had, I think we are all in the right direction. Uh, even what the governor, I think he's given a new challenge. He's also a, a chartered accountant, a management accountant. He's also on our uh, one of our patrons, I know Mariam is uh, one of the uh, star star personalities of ACCA. I think the president of uh, uh, IFAC was also from ACCA. I think uh, we, were, uh, we also gave him the uh, membership, uh, fellow membership, which he gladly accepted. But he really spoke uh, very well on sustainability. And Professor, you have to end Yeah, yeah, great uh, importance of the uh, CMA, you know, because uh, uh, we have had many leaders coming, but they've not been speaking on that sort of fashion, but we really told of the real importance, especially in this pandemic situation. So let me uh, thank uh, each and every one of you, Professor Samanti, uh, Mr. Jay Sekar, who's been supporting and uh, uh, giving everything support, our Vice President, Mr. Hennaika, then uh, Ruchira, who is there, he's been... Uh, a tower of strength to all of us and of course our speakers uh, today, uh, a chairperson, uh, Professor Samanti, as I said, of course, Mariam. Uh, I know that it's quite late for you, Mariam, because you are based in Melbourne, but thank you very much for joining with us and um, uh, working with us. And of course, Deepal, uh, certainly I think uh, maybe we may invite you once again to speak to you on these matters, but uh, I'm sure uh, there will be a response from the members of as to what they have gained. And of course, uh, uh, Hazita is not there, he's gone. Uh, but he's uh, really one of the, uh, I think, uh, one of the... I'm back, uh, Professor. I'm back. I, I uh, yeah, yeah, you are there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't see you. Huh? Anyway, uh, he's one of the leading CFOs, you know, because I think if you take all the companies, uh, he's the one who's gone through. I know he had a, a very, very... Uh, b b uh, he took a lot of beating uh, from his factories, but certainly... Uh, even from the government, but uh, they really went ahead and uh, uh, they've uh, really beaten everything. And today uh, they have uh, turned a new leaf and I'm happy that we are short of foreign exchange, that you will give more foreign exchange to the country because it's something that we are talking of. Uh, no, no dollars uh, that uh, your business is bringing in the dollars. So we are very grateful. So once again, let me thank everyone, all our participants, because uh, we had over 300 participants, uh, of course, uh, at the closing stages, you know that everyone um, is uh, too tired to stay. But thank you very much for uh, your participation. It really made uh, our event a success. And of course, as you know, uh, the contribution that you'll have made enabled us to give this free of charge to all uh, our members and others, you know, who are listening. It's uh, really as uh, the digital revolution has taken another uh, maybe turn uh, where we are at the moment, all our CPD programs, uh, we are giving free of charge to everyone, you know, so either it is taxation or whatever it is, we've been able to do that. But certainly I do hope that it will benefit everyone and also put the management accounting profession uh, right on the top. So 
thanks very much and uh, for your contributions and uh, i'm sure that you will be with us uh, in the future also and uh, once again uh, all the very best and uh, good night to all of you thank you and we will close our sessions so i think on behalf thank of you, the, thank the, you, thank the you, council sir. and all the participants I think we must be thankful to our great leader, Professor Lakshmana R. Vattavala, uh, who took a lot of interest in organizing this type of event and also uh, free of charge. Nowadays, uh, that's the most of the important thing. So thank you very much, sir, your uh, organizing ability and uh, coordinating all these activities with a great success. Wish you all the best, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Asekar. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye. You, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Hajita. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Professor Samanti. Yeah, you are always with us. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you.